Voyage of the Honor Bound by Anjali Sailor Anderson Read by Stanley Anderson Man that is in honor and understandeth not is like the beasts that perish. Psalm 49, verse 20 Prologue in Blue Darkness How can a wise man have two countries? How can a man have the earth and the wind and want a land far off, alien, smelling of palm trees, and the yellow gorse at noon in the long calms. Archibald MacLeish, American Letter Everywhere there were morning glories. They girdled him in their blueness, as the maternal arms of the flood once girdled the world. All around him rose the rustle of blue trumpets, like the soughing of the surf. From vine-laden sand, spikes of rock intruded into his path, like tide-ravished bones or antlers of coral into the lanes of undersea travelers. Deep and liquid the blueness yielded to his body's forward swimming motion. Still the infinitesimal pressure of the petals upon his skin was relentless, claustrophobic as tunnel walls. Through heaven-hued waters he skimmed. Through mine shafts of sapphire he went burrowing. Yet he perceived the luxuriance of color only upon the inward surface of his eyes. Without him he saw nothing. Dominic saw the dark not as an absence of revelation, but as a presence of obscurity. The stars which spangled the purple raiment of the tropical evening were hidden in folds. The Matariki, the little eyes, as the Tahitians called the Pleiades, had littered themselves lest he should take comfort from their watchfulness. He had known the sunset of the southern ocean as a sweet balm, and he had seen, as the legends of the islanders had forewarned him, ethereal spirits appearing in the guise of pale fire, streaking ghostly trails of glowing mist. But now the dark was dark holy, and the shadow of the banyan, the shrine of night, had devoured the moon. Without was black, yet within, where images were shaped by memory of light, it was blue that rooted his feet as he walked, stumbling over rocks, bruising, cutting. His feet were bare and hardened. Many months past he had abandoned his sea gear for native dress. The girdle of white tappa with its spreading tassels before and behind and the necklace of aromatic seeds resting upon his chest. His black waves of hair were drawn back into a pigtail, but nothing else of his sailorhood remained to distinguish him from one of the islands. His eyes had ever been dark, and his skin had been coaxed by a thousand equatorial suns, as dark as Rani's. A barrier thrust up to meet him, mid-shin high. He stumbled badly and fell. Tears started into his eyes from a painful gash in his leg, and a light warm rain mingled with them. Dominic felt beneath him to know upon what he had fallen. It was a pile of stones, placed by human hands, as a monument to the goddess, perhaps, or a marker for a grave. He groped along the cairn sideways, shuddering at how soon it ended. It was the length merely of a newly born child. Child of Rani, she of his blood's heat, or child of Lari, she of the strange eyes preternaturally blue as the ocean flowers on whose bosom he floated. Rani's child or Lari's, yet to question was to wonder no longer. Here also he had mischosen, as he had with constancy since the day he had abandoned first wisdom in the likeness of a far northern golden-haired Madonna. Whosoever his child lay dead, pure or impure of choice, the child was his. He had no heart to continue walking, anchored along his whole length to the ground beneath the morning glories, on through their blueness he delved, crawling and it seemed to him now, since his thought had made the connection, that it was the eyes of Lari into which he delved, returning to the mystery which had once disturbed him and driven him away. Now he permitted it to entwine him utterly, as it had desired to do from the violent night of his baptism in her visionary fountain. He returned into the mystery of Lari's eyes and beyond them, to a time when he could hardly remember his actual, a time before his deserting of his nation, before the venturing of his ship within the waters of the dangerous archipelago, before ever the Kona wind had carried to him the smell of night-blooming Sirius and the sound of birds screaming in the palms at dusk, ere the reckoning of a quadrant and compass rose had steered him to an island whose shores were uncorrupted by the flow of ages. There was such a time when he had not yet learned to sleep upon a pillow woven of grass and stuffed with wild thistledown, or to awake to the scent of potent blossoms and Polynesian hair. Back along the trades, along the wash of the honor-bound, he traced in his soul the way he could not journey again as the self-sane man sundered from home these fourteen years.
to the place of his beginnings, Dominic, ship's captain, might return, but not to the time before the crossing that had brought down the dark. There was now no time before he had known her works, her wrath, and the fearful worship of her unseen majesty, or had ever heard the name of Caelare. Part 1. Honor Loosed I will leave, I will leave the woods that bore me, I will pass the wide waters lonely sailing. Long are the waves on the long shore falling. Sweet are the voices on the long isle calling. J. R. R. Tolkien, The Return of the King Chapter 1. Courtship Her figurehead was a gold-haired lady with weather-worn breasts and sad green eyes. The English oak of which she was built had known better years. The great barnacles that clung to her hull were a sign of a sickness, not fatal, yet one she could not forget. She had seen far too many lands, felt too many times the rollers lift and plunge her brow. She could not endure to reckon the intolerable weight of the fathoms that had passed beneath her. Wooed and raped by blackguard breezes, what now remained of her once bright flags and streamers flew in tatters. She was a warship who warred no longer, and she could not remember why they had named her the Honor Bound. She sailed before a northeasterly wind, marking off degrees, fifteen south, a hundred and ten west, twenty-one south. Sea-worthy still, yet sea-weary. How she yearned to let out her anchor chain to its end and sail no more. But he who manned her helm drove her on toward the cloud of islands till she came to the threshold of where the hundred and twentieth meridian crosses the Tropic of Capricorn. As she recorded that threshold within her log of wandering, the wind died suddenly, and the helmsman nodded briefly to sleep beneath the afternoon glare. She was left, fearfully, to her own device. More fearfully, she discovered that she could choose. There, across the threshold, she saw him, though her mariners did not, for with purpose he confused their vision. His ferny grottoes, his canopy of green, his isles of coconuts and deep glens where lovers delight to stray, his caves and carven pools and shining beaches of volcanic and coral sand, the glittering ribbons of his waterfalls leaping in ecstasy from polys that scrape the underroof of heaven. In an instant of revelation she knew him, the perfect image of her heart's eternal dream. He smelled sweetly of sandalwood and red ginger, and he was beckoning to her, to her, the honor bound. Heave to, beloved, he said. Enter in beyond the barrier of my reef and remain. You only have I courted. The resolution passed near me, and I did not speak to her, nor did I unfold my beauty to the adventure, or to the galleons of the Spaniards who came before her. Pirates and privateers would fain have sounded the blue-green pleasures of my lagoon. Mutineers would have made me their refuge from infamy, Whalers would have rested in me from their labors, merchantmen defiled me with their commerce, and the armadas of many nations made me a game-piece in their wars. But none of these have I permitted to behold me, for it is you for whom I have waited. How fair past telling are the masts and bowsprit that support your sails! How worthy beyond praise your forecastle, your quarter-deck, and the figurehead that embodies your spirit and adorns your prow! I have desired you with profound desire, and at last you are come. Now come nearer, beloved, and heave to within my arms. So the island spoke, and she did not at once answer. His beauty was too exalted, his majesty too terrible. She could scarcely believe it was her ravaged self for whom his words were meant. Yet fearing to hope while not daring to doubt, nearly the lonely ship forsook all thought of prudence and hearkened to his call. Then suddenly she remembered her pride, and remembered, a little, why she had been given her name. Why should I heave to in the arms of you, a stranger, and not rather return to the landfalls of lovers I know well? What bridal gift have you to offer that they have not already bestowed? I have heard the music of their ripe fruits bursting with liquid joy as they drop to the ground. I have worshipped the moon where it hangs low over their basalt pinnacles and praised the delicacy of tree skeletons encased in the hardened overflow of their volcano god's passion. I have blessed the colors of a thousand shells and gloried in the impossible forms of ten thousands of fishes, and I have seen the spider, moth, and tiger orchids blooming beside the hibiscus and the golden shower tree on many shores. 
What have you to offer me more than these? I will not come to you, I will not heave to, for I am bound to honor until I sink with rotted planks beneath the tide. Thus haughtily the ship replied, though within her hollow hold she was trembling. I am bound to honor, she repeated, in a voice as hollow. You have strayed far from him, said the island. His voice was brimming with pity she could not bear. The ship began to weep. Ocean spray dashed itself upon her figurehead's cheeks and gifted the sad-eyed lady with tears. A blue shark broke through the mirror's smooth surface at her starboard side, but she did not heed it. I have strayed far, farther than the deluge was deep, and there is no way back, she wailed. Straining his sinews mightily, the island opened the coral rampart of his arms. Where had been an unbroken reef, there was now a breach. The way lies forward and through me, he whispered and waited. Chapter 2 The Seeker In the dusky cloister of his cabin, the deck-head compass tilted hypnotically on its gimbal. The pair of dividers and the straight edge with which he had been charting his course had slipped from his hand, and he realized he had been dreaming with his eyes open. The dream, as he remembered it, had two parts. In the first, he had returned to his nation, and was sentenced as a deserter to the gallows. As the hempen noose was being fitted around his neck, he searched the crowd of spectators to see if there were any who knew or loved him, but there was no one. None but Marielle, holding in her arms the bloody-soaked body of an infant girl, and she was laughing. The second dream was not such a nightmare, yet again it was Marielle that was at its heart. He stood with her upon a dock beside a dark, turbulent ocean, with no light to their love's tragedy but that of the moon springing back in sparks of gold from her hair. She plucked a strand of it and laid it in his hand. He stretched the strand taut, peered through it deeply as into a diviner's crystal, and was overwhelmed with joy. And it was this dream that now caused him to be shaken, and not the other. Now, as the compass at which he had blindly stared sharpened into focus, Ebbing joy lingered at his margins like foam upon the sand after waves have withdrawn. For an instant he sought to regather it, came fully to himself, and thrust it away. It was a false oracle, this chimera of unquiet sleep, knowing its own necessity as surely as a forked hazel senses the presence of moisture. His soul's needle pointed forward for the slaking of its thirst and not behind. Mariel had hindered him from turning where he would find true north, and he had left her long ago. Dominic, captain of the frigate Honor Bound, returned his concentration to his charts, measuring parallelism with the compass roses and pricking off the dead reckoning. Though thirteen years at sea and six in the tropics had lent the color of health and vigor to his naturally pale skin, at first glance he appeared unlikely as a figure of authority. Not uncommonly short, yet he was not tall, and he was frailly built for a seaman. His voice was not commanding, but had a callow uncertainty to it which made him sound young at thirty-eight, and slow-witted if one hearkened only to the tone and not the words. Had he indeed so swayed the loyalty of a warship's crew that every man had forgotten his duty to country and kin? At first glance it was inconceivable, but then one noticed his eyes. He was a white man, and nothing in the almost feminine comeliness of his features suggested otherwise. Yet in his eyes was the inscrutability of the Orient, a fanatic haunting desert caves, feeding on locusts and wild honey, whose strength is in his silence. Sensitive of emotion, yet the eyes betrayed a force of will not to be gainsaid, even at the price of cruelty, so tender and still so cruel. Marielle had been neither first nor last to be broken upon that paradox. Many had puzzled at this, his strange dual patrimony, but, looking into his eyes, they did not wonder at his power. It was a power that would not bear the servitude of the democratic or the monarchic yoke, that would wear no band of wedlock. The latter he had realized earliest, having already plighted troth to a green-eyed beauty and gotten her with child. He had received his commission from the nation, and Maria Annabelle, Marielle, was the intimate contraction by which he referred to her in only her hearing. Marielle had known when she accepted him that his naval career necessitated his frequent and lengthy parting from her. What she had not known was that, a month ere his ship sailed, he had determined that the parting, when it came, should be for all time. 
Despite this determination, and to satisfy a need he could not name, he had had the figurehead of the honor-bound carved and painted in Muriel's likeness. Perhaps it was because, in his quest for that, of which he never spoke to her, a reminder of his beginnings was his best measure of how near he must be to his end. While he had been with her, he had been as tender a lover as a woman could want. With what blithe cruelty he had slipped a letter into her hand when, just before the ship's embarking, she bade him good-bye. As the honor-bound drew away from the dock, she had begun to read it, and as she read he had watched her face. She had raised her eyes to meet him, and in them were neither tears nor anger, nor, unbelievably, condemnation. It was as if she were saying to him wordlessly, I knew you, Dominic, from the first moment, and yet I chose to love you. That was the last he knew of her, except because she had written no others, or because the others had been lost, for a single letter which had overtaken him at the Golden Horn. It said only, We have a daughter, Dominic. I have named her Scarlet. Please come home to her. Marielle. I have named her Scarlet. Despiser of popular religion that he was, he could never again bear to hear Clement quote the passage from the prophet that ran, Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. It seemed, more and more over the course of their friendship, to become the passage his double-minded chaplain was most fond of. He believed, not without reason, that Clement was mocking him. As he had borne not to be chained by one woman, so, within a very few years, he had found that allegiance to a state, whether under rule of king or common man, was not to be endured. And it seemed to him, in so discovering, that he was not loosing himself from honorable patriotism, but from blind slavery. The nation was not honorable. Its wars were petty and for material gain, and its treatment of those who served it was without conscience. He had won his men's obedience without such punishment. But he had seen the nation's wrath against error as it was wreaked on other ships. He had seen a man nailed by his hand to the mast with his own knife. This, for inciting a fight in which another man had slightly bloodied his nose. He had seen a man, for the crime of stubbornness, keel-hauled and brought up to the deck so lacerated by rusted nails and spikes of the hull that he had bled to death within the hour. He had seen a boy of thirteen flogged through the fleet from ship to ship without pity. He had pitied a murderer whose sentence was to be thrown overboard tied to the corpse of the man he had killed. Dominic understood the uses of cruelty but only to a purpose. The cruelty of the nation seemed solely for the sake of breaking its subjects' wills, and he resolved that, as he would not consent to break, he would not permit to be broken the men of weaker resolve who put their trust in him. One morning, while bound for a contested port there to reinforce the fleet, he and his crew had with one mind changed bow for stern and sailed away. The fleet had been outnumbered and defeated with great loss of life. But Dominic had no regret. Henceforth he owed allegiance only to the treasure of his seeking. Yet, as his chosen figurehead recalled his forsworn love to him, so by choice he had kept within his sea-chest a token of his second loyalty's renunciation. The coat of his uniform with its gaudy epaulets heightened by contrast, the fascination of what else the chest held. He had nearly committed the coat to the ocean's graveyard with those of the rest of the officers, but at the last moment had decided to retain it. It pleased him to see it lying in rejection, as it pleases a blasphemer to keep a crucifix that he might look upon it and know that it means nothing. Having completed his reckoning, Dominic rose, stooping slightly for the cabin's little headroom, stepped to the chest and knelt before it, and reverently lifted its lid. Within was the rare harvest for which he had spurned conventional fealties and domestic pleasures, a pack of tarot cards inscribed in Romani, a druidic idol, an African fetish, there was an illuminated manuscript on magic arts, an alchemist's diary, and a heretic's Bible with certain passages torn out. There was a key carven from the bone of a human finger which was said to open the gates of Tartarus, and the seed of a fruit from the tree of knowledge from which the first man and his mate were expelled from Eden. His parents, while respectable to the eyes of society, had been vague pagans. His mother had been fond of claiming that he had been blessed with special gifts by the gods not by the god of Abraham and Isaac, but by more mysterious and more potent deities. The gifts she had meant were his physical beauty, strength of intellect, and power of influence over his fellows and over women. She had taught him to be proud of these excellencies of nature, but as he grew older, Dominic understood that it was not enough. There was another manner of gift that he came to desire, and beyond desiring, know is his destiny, a power of the spirit, 
of the spirit behind all spirits. He had discounted with hardly a thought the teachings of church and synagogue, for he did not believe truth so common as to be sanctioned by the masses. Equally foreign to him was the sneering skepticism of the materialist. What those of another persuasion might have counted among his blessings, had it not taken an occult turn, was his awareness from earliest childhood of a realm beyond the natural, one which swayed the course of men and nations unperceived by any but a few, which fixed their fortunes if they would not learn the secret of yoking it to their wills. The agnosticism that cares for nothing for what is not seen was as blind a guide in his judgment as were the platitudes of Christianity. To ask for what purpose he desired such a gift was to comprehend neither the gift nor the desire. He desired it for its own flavor and sake, as unexplainably as a man yearns for a woman of a particular cast of mind or body simply because she is she. Once, in a moment of self-doubt, he had asked himself what he should do with it, the elemental secret of being, if he should find it. And he had answered himself that the possession itself was perfect action. I am that I am, spake the Hebrew God to Moses, himself no mean magician. When he possessed the secret he sought, to say, I am Dominic, would suffice for all. In times past, when cruelty had been necessary to his quest, Clement had admonished him piously that love is the fulfilling of the law. To Dominic, the fulfilling of the law of his will, the will to know what he would know, and glory in the knowing, was the demarcation of every love and all hatred. And what had he come to know after so long seeking? Something to his purpose, but more of the boundaryless breadth of his own coveting. He knew the rudiments of magic, white and black, as it is performed in diverse lands, and he knew as fact wonders of the ocean that landsmen dismiss as legend. He had seen phantoms dance at the ends of the yard-arm, heard disembodied voices call aloud from the tops, and had lost one of its crew to the force of an invisible hand that had torn the sailor from the rigging. He had seen Remora monsters attach their suckers to the hulls of full-laden vessels and hold them immobile. He had watched a bevy of mermaids chase each other through cells of coral, catching their long hair in its twigs. He had espied from far away, and yet too near for fearfulness, the sea serpent. While rounding the Cape of Good Hope, he had encountered the Flying Dutchman, who was said to bring ill luck to any who had crossed his path. Dominic no more believed in luck than he believed in that blasphemy for which the Dutchman had been condemned to roam the high seas eternally was possible. He had succeeded in exchanging words with that spirit, and no ill luck had come upon him, though the ship that had rounded the cape behind him had perished thereafter in the vortex of Charybdis. The more of magic and of wonder that unveiled itself for him, the more he coveted to know the crowning wonder of the voyage not yet undertaken. And at last, when thwarted years began to turn the search desperate and stale, he had met with a ship that told him tales of Captain James Cook and his discoveries, the Sandwich Islands, the Societies, the Georgian Cluster, and its three-peaked king, Otaheite. The ship was called the Bounty, and was itself bound for Polynesia. Following anon in her unhappy wake, he was to hear more of her. The vision of the islands had righted his skewed sight and restored his hope, his uncanny sense to detect the fragrance of the secret now identified the place of its origin. Five years the honor bound had cast her shadow in the South Seas, passing from landfall to landfall, gleaning revelations more confounding than the mysteries they banished. To his chest he had added queer stones that gave birth to smaller identical stones, and a net of hibiscus bark beneath which spirits of the overworld and the abyss must assume their true shapes. He had there a collection of the tail feathers of man-of-war birds, useful for propitiating Polynesian deities, and a murex shell in which was trapped the singing demon, more mind-shattering than the sirens of Odysseus. He had a twined wreath of pandanus leaves, sign of a native taboo that he had violated, acknowledging nothing is forbidden. And he had heard from the islanders of the Varua Ino and the Tupapau, of how the departed are scraped thrice by their ancestors with a serrated shell and thus rendered imperishable. He had become proficient in Ahikuni, the sorcery of the Sandwich Islands, and had studied the history of the gods Hiro and Ta'arawa, and he had felt the chill winds of Po, the state of night where dwell the gods of the dead, blow over him. His vocabulary contained summoning words for calling up the blue shark, the god's messenger. Spectral banyan trees, he now knew, grew upon the moon and are responsible for its shadows. 
By the fellowship of man and by the lust of woman he had strung his strand of truth, nor were the mysteries of sex itself absent in the telling of his esoteric rosary. Each bead was a pearl of worth, and to the heart of the seeker there was one that was beyond all price. Particulars varied from tale to tale, but through the legends of the islanders ran a common stream of assurance that somewhere in their midst sprang the fountain of life. Some said it had been among them once and was no more, for it had been dispersed into the deep when Ruahatu, the Neptune of the South Seas, brought a great flood upon the earth in wrath at fishermen who had invaded his sacred temple. Others said that the fountain yet was, but was hidden by the gods, lest by means of its waters men should grow equal with them and reverence them no more. To this latter opinion, that the fountain flowed still, Dominic clung, and he defied all powers not his own in earth or heaven to seal it from him. He did not yet know the secret, but he knew now where the knowing of it was to be found. Where was the fountain, there abode the spirit, without whose possessing he would lack the peace of completion. For five years he had sought it, and for so long what powers there were had rebuked him and thrust him back. He had put forth spells, both light and dark, had prayed and cursed by turns, but his influence over men seemed not to extend to the guardians of the waters. Then in anger he had set his back to the islands, and had taken the honor bound to the south of the Americas, where he had alternated between debaucheries of the flesh and spiritual inquiries into the ways of the Mayas and the Incas. But the seduction of his heart's foremost mistress had been too strong, and now at last he had turned his prow again. Now he was running before a northeasterly wind fifteen degrees east of the Paumatu archipelago, with only a man of the cloth and a teenage boy left as his crew, the rest of his men having one by one fallen away. He, Dominic, had taught them desertion, yet he knew that he could have held them from going with the same precise mastery he exerted over himself. One by one he had felt them an impediment to his search, and had released them, all but the two who were most loyal to him and whom he most loved, though the one infuriated him with his erratic devoutness, and the other with his naivete. Soon again, now, Brian and Clement would steer him through the sentinel palms that marked the breach in a reef, and would again walk Polynesian sands, taking to them the women of their choice. Behind was Mariel, wrongly heralded by treacherous dreams as the secret of his joy. Before was the one secret, whispered in the rush of fountain splash and foam. Closing his sea chest and setting it aside, Dominic's eyes riveted in sudden intensity upon the tilting compass. As the slow heat and languor of the tropical afternoon he watched it, it began to spin out of all control. Chapter 3 The Faithless Heart To windward hovered a cloud with a purple heart. Funnel-shaped, it descended to meet the waves, and there it became a rising fountain, from which the leviathans and the sea-satyrs scattered in terror. Helm in hand, he watched the water spout and softly sang. Deep to deep calls out the wear of her To weather or to lee But I am deaf and in disfavor The heart of God grieves not for me nor heeds the changeful songs of those who waver. The sun shed withering glory on the brown of his beard and hair, leathering the skin that sheathed his angular features and causing a hundred tiny riverbeds for tears to form around his hazel eyes. His cambric shirt clung to him wetly, but the dryness of drought-ridden summers reigned in his heart. Signs in moon and sun show forth her secret To those who can discern But I am blind and cast away The heart of God grieves not for me Nor looks upon the faithless when they pray Puffs of air from unseen islands danced around him, bearing the fragrances of wood smoke, moist earth, and intoxicating blooms. But in his heart's desert, the tracks of the scather of souls crisscrossed mounds of sand, and amidst the desolation no flower sprang. 
The passing winds foretell to me her touch, the shivering and the heat. But I am numb and deep defiled. The heart of God grieves not for me, nor holds in wounded hand the devil's child. Mare's tails cantering lazily across the sky turned greenish black, threatening hurricane. The veiled stars were perplexed in their courses, and from the heart of thunder rolled a knell round the circumference of the earth. Seven thunders bade me cry her name to shake the world from sleep. But I am tongueless, sealed in pride. The heart of God grieves not for me nor speaks his peace to souls whose light has died. Rays of gold sheared through the cloud's fleece, and there was a calm. But within him, upon a sea of affliction, the waves raged yet, slapped his heart broadside with all their force, and covered it o'er. Male and female, two and two, the beasts Filled all the ark with joy While mateless still I drown in sin The heart of God grieves not But mocks my willful wayward plea To enter in Then at the heels of the flood there followed a rainbow from whose promise his heart turned away. A shining bow bestrides the firmament and guides the blessed to good. But faithless hearts cannot discover the ways of God with man, nor hope in life her to embrace their chosen lover. The song of Clement's own making segued into silence. The wood beneath his hands, which while the song lasted he imagined as his mandolin, took again the form of a wheel, and the art he practiced was only helmsmanship once more. So reduced was the crew of the honor bound that the task of steering her had fallen to him perforce. He, a pilot, was himself utterly adrift, and the irony of this was not lost on him. Unstable as water thou shalt not excel. These words of the patriarch Israel to Reuben, his firstborn, had echoed in Clement's hearing from the time his self-consciousness gained a memory. His father, a clergyman in the Puritan school, had been wont to use scripture more to measure fault than to encourage or inspire. As an only son, Clement had been expected to follow in his father's vocation, but of his father's nature he had inherited nothing, unless it was the dark blot at his center that swallowed hope. His father was supremely practical, believing that any work not contributing to the physical necessities of oneself, one's family, or the poor, was the devil's work. That which served only to delight the soul all reading but for the Holy Bible, dancing, game-playing, the fashioning of anything for the sake of its beauty, was forbidden in his household. Clement, from an early age, had seen a contradiction in expanding such energies on the needs of bodies that were, according to his father's theology, wholly corrupt. Nor could he believe that the creator of the world's beauties had taken no pleasure in them, meaning them only as a snare for a sinful man. Yet even if his fervent mind had contracted to suit his father's narrowness, his brimming heart could have never. Clement was an artist, a spinner of poetry and melody, and a weaver of tales, a lover of all things lovely. This was his inheritance from his mother, who had been a painter until his father had ordered her to cease, on peril of violating the second commandment. His name also had come from his mother. His father abominated Clement as a papist name, and had christened him Jonah Nehemiah, after his favorite Old Testament prophets but his mother had never ceased to call him Clement when his father was not in hearing. Though there had been little of aesthetic attraction in Clement's indoor life, 
Even as an infant, his fascination with nature, its patterns and colors, its shifting moods, whether majestic, serene, or wild, had been apparent and had earned his father's frown. His penchant for words had also appeared early, for he had memorized in one hearing the Bible stories and psalms his mother read to him, and, to his father's horror, had sometimes proposed alternative endings. All music but that of hymns was censored, yet he had at the age of three begun singing to himself little tunes that had more of wistfulness about them than the solemn piety of which his father approved. Unstable as water. Clement's mother, before her arranged and unwilling marriage, had been not only a creative woman but a passionate and romantic one. In this also Clement was her heir. His emotions capriciously raced up hills and plunged into valleys. He soared or sank in the throes of historic loves and joys, disappointments and despairs, while his father trudged always along the same stoic road of duty and rectitude, seeming neither to heed nor even feel the pull of the depths or the heights. His mother had learned to turn her passions inward, to bite her lips till they bled and keep silence. She could not bear to teach the same to Clement, nor would he bear to be so taught. Thou shalt not excel. His father's prediction of mediocrity had come true. His father had trained him to preach when his longing was to sing, had exhorted him to love God alone when he yearned to love humanity and the earth it inhabited with all his mind and heart. The result was a poor preacher and a commonplace poet, a man of little faith and a wandering lover. His father was great in faith and in faithfulness to his wife, of no weakness pertaining to these could Clement accuse him, though he despised his father's manner of being strong. Contrarily, Clement knew his own weakness to be great, for though he had Christian belief and knowledge in plenty, it did not spur him to good deeds or to save him from despair. And though he had love in plenty, it never lighted for long on the beauty of one object or one woman, but that it must soon take wing for another. When at last he could no longer kick against his father's goads, or endure to behold the stifled thing that had become made of his mother, and when the beauties of his nation were tried and found wanting, he had signed on as a chaplain on the warship Honor Bound, departing without farewell but for a verse left beneath his mother's pillow. He prayed, with little faith, on the breast of Mother Ocean to find a beauty that was at one with peace, a love both stable and excellent. What he found, in his unbelief, was suffering and unrest, larger longing and smaller hope of being fulfilled. He had knelt with the ship's surgeon in the dark, reeking hold between kegs of wine and rum, holding the hand of a man while his leg was sawn off by the light of a few tallow candles. He had watched men die of the scurvy, their skin hardening, their gums swelling and turning black, their teeth loosening, their inward parts bleeding. He had seen the fingers of sailors turn gangrenous from one contact too many with wet and weather had seen mosquitoes and foul water bring on the plagues of malaria and typhoid fever. All these perils his seafaring flock endured, and beyond them the perils of the sea itself. Yet when peace was declared, the greater part of the men would be left without a penny, and unable to find the means to earn one, their wives and children having long since given them up for dead. So heartless was the nation to whose aid they had pledged allegiance, so untender the God in whose fatherhood they trusted. It was not the nation's heartlessness that had led Clement to follow Dominic in desertion. Aching for life's caress, he had learned rather to expect its iron hand. But though the horrors of sickness, poverty, and abandonment were only the nation's sin by way of the sin of its people, there was one iniquity of which it and its sons were guilty that he would not pardon. The nation had begun, in order to relieve its shortage of fighting men, to impress free men from merchant ships in the service of its wars. It was this offense against freedom of choice perhaps in reaction to his father's extreme Calvinism, that had driven his cheek-turning spirit to refuse to turn once more. Yet even in his defense of freedom, Clement remained a fatalist in temperament. Man, gifted with choice, appeared to him as if destined to choose wrong. All things might work together for good to those who love God, but who among his wretched brood could love him? Clement knew that he was not wholly bereft of blessing. He had desired to embrace beauty and its attendant ecstasy in his travels, and though the odors of bilge water, dry rot, and dead rats which pervaded the honor bound might pollute the romance of voyaging, still the sea had yielded to him some little of his enchantment. Luminous fish poured glory from the deeps as wondrous as heaven's own stars. The phosphorescent Pacific waters were a portion of joy, newly decanted from the hand of creation, if only he could have drunk it and lived. Running in the tracks of the waves, he had drawn near in love to the flowers and trees that bloom on many shores. The peacock flower of Trinidad, the rain lily of South America, 
the flame of the woods of Java, the traveler's tree of Madagascar, as from Suriname to the Sargasso Sea he had sailed, from Borneo to Barbados to the Bay of Biscay, beauty had cast her net for him, till at last in Polynesia he was caught by her, and she that had been but a whisper amid the cacophony of his soul became incarnate. Hawaii was a piece of her flesh, Otaheite her breasts, Nukuhiva her arms, gray of cliff, green of palm, pale blue of sky, azure of sea, lagoon water shimmering over shoals, darkening over unlit valleys, swells breaking in white fire on ledges of coral. Beauty was here among the islands. They were the singing shell of her, but nowhere could he find her heart. He might have wooed it to audible beating, if only he could ensnarl his passion for her in one perfect series of notes or imprison it in an unwavering word. But he, for all his artistry, in all his mediocrity, could not, and heart to heart's answer remained a dream of the day after. The sea had blessed him with a measure of companionship. He regretted his faithlessness, if only for the sake of the sailors whose souls were committed to his care, for he truly loved these poor in spirit, these wealthy in contradiction though in the eyes of the world they were beyond the pale of salvation, he had found them to be without guile, generous, truthful, easily made happy. Introspective and emotional, yet their emotions were brief, conservative in thought, delighting in examinations of the more obscure portions of scripture as their only intellectual resource, yet they were heathenously superstitious, and drank, swore, fought, and sinned with all manner of women freely. He loved them each, and had grieved to see them go, first the bosom, then the quartermaster, then the officer of the deck and the chief mate, next the helmsman, whose place he now filled, the master-at-arms, the foretopman, the first lieutenant, and the surgeon gone last of all. He had grieved for them and their fallen good natures, though of his own nature they had had no understanding. Why had he cleaved to the honor bound when all the rest had sundered from her? Not for respect of Dominic's fanatic occultism, for Dominic's secret was not his. To seek among the islands for spiritual wisdom seemed foolish and futile to Clement. The Polynesian gods possessed no morals, were not benevolent unless bribed, and had been born, according to their worshippers, from a state of chaos and darkness. If Clement could not rise fully to his own faith, yet he could not descend to this, and the fountain to him was a dream passed away with Eden. Not at such a font would outcast man shed his curse of death, but though he had no respect for Dominic's search, he loved him too entirely to leave him. Dominic was powerful where he was impotent, determined where he was despairing, driven straight upon one course where he crookedly staggered. And even while he winced at Dominic's cruelty and pitied his unthinking pride, he knew that, whether free or fated, his captain's day of judgment was joined with his. Brian's fate appeared to be one with theirs also, though it pained Clement that this should be so, the innocent condemned with the mortally guilty. The honor bound's remaining midshipmen served Clement somewhat in the office of a saint, as none among the various patrons of sailors, Saints Peter, Michael, Elmo, Nicholas, or Erasmus, would deign to heed him. Brian David was a strange object of sainthood. At nineteen he was experienced by eight years in every vice that a dissolute crew could teach him. And yet, while misled to unchristian deeds, he remained mysteriously pure in heart, it was as if, having been born with every man's allotment of original sin, he had added nothing to that measure by his passing through the perishing world. For the love of Brian and of Dominic, Clement was bound dishonorably to the honor bound, and for the love of one thing other. Dominic's secret was not his. As Dominic spoke his own without fear, Clement cherished his in inner trembling and silence. There was no heart's song, not of beauty, nor excellency in art, nor friendship, nor the mercy of God, for which he listened with more eager and anguished an ear. Deep to deep calls out the wear of her, but faithless hearts cannot discover the ways of God with man nor hope in life ere to embrace their chosen lover. And at the altar of her image Clement adored. Beyond all things he loved his love of her. He could no longer keep account of the women with whom he had been enamored, whom he had taken to himself with or without their wills upon his voyage. Always within an hour or a day or a month at most, he would know that this was not she. Sometimes he was certain that she must not be, and then again he would be sure that she was, and was held back from him as punishment for his sin and faithlessness. He was cast away from the heart of God, and as the Lord who hated him dogged Clement's steps with engines of war, 
He knew that he would never find her. Yet he could not cease to love that hopeless love or to seek its redeeming joy, lest he breathe out his spirit willingly into hell. It was not a vision of what would be, but a deceiving dream. Yet under the southern cross on still warm sand, dark hair cascaded over him, dark eyes immersed his, and royal lips whispered kingship to him in a word. Tane, husband. Moved by that word, Clement sang a second song and the wind that swelled the honor-bound sails fell still. I have a mare, a tempered steed, a high-born creature she, for it's from the sea-foam that she sprang, like a cold white streak of light to see. This mare will have no saddle, no bridle will she wear, she knows by sense for where I am bound, and she'll have no rest till she takes me there. She rides me high, she rides me low, she rides as fast she can. She rides me into my true love's arms, and to me my love pledges her maiden hand. The way-worn destrier he rode was the honor-bound, curvetting along the path of whales from the Septentrion to the Antipodes, galloping past grottoes where play the Menahune, upturning ocean shadows with her hooves. Fleetly she spanned the earth's wings as she paced toward her landfall. There, where the breakers crash in fury and ecstasy against the last cliff, he, her pilot, would cry his valediction to these transient waters and plunge into the spouts and sea-fires of eternity, into the fountain's rising brightness. The fountain was but a dream, but as he sang, the dream grew deeper. My love appears to me at will when day breaks chill and bleak, and brushes then with sultry lips the tears like stardust from my cheek. My love draws near to me at will When night falls dim and red More near than do the silken sheet Than the swan's down pillow beneath my head My love entangles me at will Within an onyx chain and scores me with a ruby lash, and scalds me with an emerald pain. Then sparks and spangles she does string, a necklace fashions me, binds roses white upon my brow, my waist with a sash of burgundy. The song was awry where there were no silken sheets on Polynesian shores, and plumeria blossomed instead of roses, and belts of foam for burgundy sashes. The dream was amiss, for the fountain could not be found. But the dream was deep, and it deepened past dream into vision, and the chain and the lash and the pain of the song were the throes of death, and the adorning of the final verse was funereal. A swordfish, the servant of God, had struck through the heart of the ship and through his, a sword shall pierce through thy own soul also, Luke 2.35. And the flood will come again in spite of the rainbow. And the tide will ebb, and the dead will be carried out beyond the reef. If a man die, shall he live again? This corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. For man that is in honor, and understandeth not, is like the beasts that perish. As Clement stood entranced before the helm, the wind that had died was reborn, and his sleep that was more than sleep rode on the wind away. He had thought for a moment that he had seen a dark purple land haze widening into an island of incomparable beauty. But with the passing of the vision, doubt returned to his eyes in greater force than he had ever known it, so that he was not certain even of the wood beneath his shivering hands. Chapter 4 The Motherless Child His first memory was of a fist against his cheekbone. He ached to recall it even now, and amid the pain he prayed for a blessing upon the deliverer of the blow. Though his father's love for him had been measured in lashes, he could not bring himself to cast reproach. Lashes had taught him a lesson of value, for before his fourth birthday, Brian David had vowed that he would never strike a man while he lived. Perching in the cross trees with spyglass in hand, 
Brian gazed across the jeweled expanse of waters toward the beloved islands to which his ship was returning. The sun suckled him with tender warmth. Trade winds playfully disarrayed his gleaming hair. Alone of the honor-bound's trinity of men, his was an absolute contentment. He was happy alike in silence as in speech, yet fullness of remembrance now moved him to seek out a confidant. Stowing his glass, he clambered down the shrouds of the forecastle deck, leaned out over the prow, and stroked the figurehead's wooden tresses. He imagined his mother looking so, for her hair also had been golden, and her eyes green. The radiance of the hair had been passed down to him, though his burning blue eyes were his father's. Of his father and of his mother he thought and spoke, and the figurehead kept his secrets, pondering them in her heart. My father was not a cruel man, not in his nature, but he was not strong at the shouldering of crosses. When my mother died in bearing me, it was too heavy for him, and he gave the cross over to Jamaica Rum and to me, for I was the reason of his sorrows. He was captain of one of the nation's proudest ships. Men respected him once, I have been told, and many women loved him. Mother was the fairest of them, an admiral's daughter, noble and sweet, and father worshipped the dust of her shoes. He thought that she should have borne sons and daughters aplenty to be the staff of his age and hers, but that one ill-begotten child for so I was to him, had devoured her life to feed its own. He endured it by drowning himself in drink, and beating me or abandoning me, according to his mood. He hired governesses, seven or eight to tell all, but they were tender-hearted and interfered when he turned his anger on me, so he gave me into the care of a tapster's wife whose temper was sharp enough to please him. She taught me to sweep and to swill and to serve tables, but not to read, for she knew nothing of books." father was at sea sometimes for a year or more, and his homecomings were bitter enough. He could not look upon me, you see, but that the ghost of my mother would be standing between us and accusing me of murder. He would not talk of her unless quite besotted with rum, and then his telling of her goodness would make me weep, and wish that I had died in her womb and she had been saved. Always, after he talked of her, he would end by beating me. I never turned his beating back on him, for to beat a man one must hate him, if only for that moment and I have found no man to hate as yet. I never gave my father another cause to blame me beyond the one of being born, except that once I stole from him. Once, when he was in his drink, he took a box from a secret place behind his bed and wept over it and caressed it. He babbled about how my mother had willed it to me in an hour between my bearing and her dying. When he was sober, I asked him of the box and what was in it and whether it were meant for me. He beat me as badly as ever he had, and forbade me to touch the box or talk of it on peril of worse. I was seven then, and for the next four years I thought of the box and what it might hold, but I did nothing against my father's command. Then one day, when I was at my work in the tavern, father returned from a six-month sailing with a uniform of my size in one hand and a sword in the other. The nation is not unwilling to take on midshipmen so young if they are the sons of officers. I did not weep to leave, for serving a warship, thought I, must be a fitter task for a man than serving drunkards. I wept a little for my father, though doubtless he would be more at peace when I was gone. On the night before my ship set sail, when he was in a deep rum sleep, I took the box from its hiding place and opened it by the light of the full moon shining in my father's window. Two things were within, a delicately carved rosary and a rolled letter which I, being ignorant, could not read, but I supposed that it was written in my mother's hand. I hung the rosary around my neck, beneath my clothes, so that it would not be seen, and stowed the letter away among my gear. I imagined my father's rage upon finding them taken, but I knew that I would not be there to bear the brunt of it. I imagined that, before he died, he would be glad that they were mine, as mother wished, and I felt her gladness approving my deed from heaven. The warship where I began my sea life was captained by a man like my father, a good leader but given to fits of violence. I think, though, that his cruelty was more a part of him, for he was both more ruthless than my father and more cunning. Whether it were at my father's request or on his own whim, the captain seemed to lay on me more than my share of tasks. Yet I did them as best I might, and without complaining, for I was thankful for my change of life, though it was not an easy one. In truth, I liked the work, and was happy enough whether rowing in the boats, or pushing the capstan, or stewing in the galley, or swabbing the deck. I never claimed my rank over those below me, nor entered into quarrels, and some of the crew were kind to me because of it, and others jeered and called me white-livered. 
I used to sing a bit sometimes as I worked, and I could feel the captain's evil eye upon me, as though he would rather that I should have cursed than sung. Indeed, it seemed it was my graces more than my sins that awakened the captain's devil. Perhaps he thought that my character was not in keeping with a man of wars, and perhaps this chafed him ever the more as I grew older, but no readier in mind for battle. One morning, two years after I had come aboard, a sailor tripped me as I was swabbing the deck, not knowing that the captain was watching. I fell, bloodying myself a little and bruising myself fairly. I rose and turned my back to my work, for I saw no advantage in chiding a man for a thing done out of sheer ill-temper. It was but a moment later that I felt the captain's iron grip upon my shoulder. "'And will you take that silently, boy?' he said, squinting at me in an unfriendly manner. I could not tell whether to say I or nay, so I straightened the shoulder under his hand and smiled at him pleasingly. But the captain was not pleased. He commanded the offending sailor to come and stand before me, and the man, cowering, came. "'Strike him, Bran,' the captain said. "'Take your vengeance.' Then he watched to see whether I would obey. I turned pale, for I had never defied the captain's orders or those of my superior officers. But I had taken an oath that I would not inflict on any man what my father had on me, and so my hands stayed at my sides. The captain turned as red as I was pale, and his look and his voice were dangerous. "'Belay this disobedience, Brian, and avenge yourself,' he said. "'I warn ye, you'll not go free if you defy me.' Then it went hard with me, for I had no wish to act against him, nor either to act against what was honorable. But my oath was the stronger, and I answered him, "'I will not, sir. I will not strike a man.' The captain's hand went around my throat, where my father's hand had left its mark often. "'And you'll not shoot a man, nor run him through with the sword in battle, neither, I'll warrant ye, though he be your enemy and your nations. Be ye a girl, or only a coward? I tell you once more to strike him and prove yourself a man of metal, or ye'll rue it sorely.' So said he, and so I. "'Then I must rue it, Captain.' The captain smiled, and I knew that my answer was as he had hoped, though he feigned it to be otherwise. "'We meet the fleet tomorrow at dawn, Brian,' spoke the devil in him, for I rightly believed that he was possessed. "'Look to yourself, then, boy. Aye, look to yourself, then. On the next day at dawn our ship joined with the fleet, and the captain ordered me flogged from ship to ship till I fainted. I know how to bear a beating, and it was many strokes of the whip before I bowed beneath it. My last thought, as my sense was leaving, was that the blood might stain my mother's rosary. But though none of us saw her, there was another ship, a deserter, standing out at a distance from the fleet, and her captain had witnessed my flogging through his glass. In the second night watch, five of his men put out a boat and rowed to the ship on whose quarter-deck I had been left to die. They overpowered the watch and stole me away with them, and when next I knew myself, I was in the service of the honor-bound, under way for the islands." So the turning tide brought another change to me, and instead of a captain that oppressed me, I served one that treated me with friendship, and instead of a life of war, I lived a life of peace, among islands so beautiful as the Garden of Eden must have been when it bloomed all glorious. In truth, I am thankful for the peace and friendship, yet there is another thing for which I am happier. That is the fortune of meeting Clement, for it was he that taught me to read. For the two years aboard my first ship I had kept my mother's letter, never knowing what was within it, but believing that it held something that was needful for me to learn. I had thought of asking one of the lettered men among the officers to read it, but had shrunk back as it seemed it should stay private between my mother and me. I swore that some day I would learn letters and read it for myself, and maybe she that wrote it was working in heaven on my behalf. When I woke to find myself upon the honor bound, the ship's surgeon was tending to my wounds, but it was Clement that knelt beside him into whose eyes I looked first. A worship has no need of books but for the best book, and so it was the scripture that I learned from. Oh, there was joy in the deciphering of the words, and joy in their meaning. It was six years ago now, my first lesson. I learned without working long over it, for I love it so. I spend an hour every day at reading, if Dominic can spare me. I think sometimes he would rather I had stayed ignorant, for he accuses Clement of misleading me, and me of believing what I read too easily. I have read the old part of the book four times over, and the new three times so many, but I am never tired of them. In the old stories I like best the story of Noah, for as the ark preserved him and his family from perishing, so did the honor bound save me, since my first captain would have seen me dead sure and soon. But the story that makes my heart to beat fit for bursting is the story of the crucified one, him that I wear in my mother's rosary. 
In the tavern and on my first ship, I had only heard him talked of in curses and knew nothing of what he really was, which was God walking on the earth. He knew how to bear a beating like I do, and he never raised his hand against any man but the money changers that were defiling the temple of his father. And even death could not stop him from doing what he came for, but was obliged to help his purpose along. And that is a comfort and a rightful joy. But I have not told you of my mother's letter. I have not told anyone, not even Clement. But I think that you may keep my secret well enough. When at last I had learned enough to read it, I crawled into a coil of line where no man would disturb me, and unrolled the letter with my hands a-trembling mightily, and the tears threatening to drown both it and me. And this is what my mother wrote to me in her dying hour. Brian David, David means beloved, never grieve that God has taken me back in giving life to you. He has told me, Brian, and you must always remember that you were born for a purpose. They were not many words, but they were words meant for me, and come from God as surely as the words of the book I knew. And I knew that I had no need to seek and seek like Clement and the captain, for my own purpose would find me soon enough if I but waited for it. There would come a day when there was a thing I must do, and I would recognize it, like the crucified one knowing that he had to die, and I would do it, and make a meaning of my father's sorrow and my mother's gift to me. I wish that the captain had found his truth as I have, and Clement his beauty and his love that he has lost hope for. I am considered as a man, though I feel a child still, but I am only half the age of Dominic, and but little more than half that of Clement. Yet they have not a whisper in their ears of the secret I have been told, or else the whisper is too small and still for them to hear. Clement talks of me as though I were a saint, and himself the chief of sinners. But he is a better man than he thinks, and makes himself worse than he is by thinking it. His trouble is that he imagines too clearly what will make him happy. He scorns his own skill with melody and words, yet I know of none more lovely. He makes himself desperate over desiring to hold beauty in his hand, when it is embracing him all around and cherishing him. The island people swimming in their lagoons among a rainbow of fish, and bathing in mountain streams that bubble for joy, that is beauty. Their chanting sings beauty pure and plain, and the beating of their sharkskin drums, and their bamboo flutes, and the jessamine in the hair of the women, and the mother of pearl hung about their breasts when they dance. There is beauty in the island days, and in the nights so dreamily passing, and there is love in them, and everywhere beneath the sun, if Clement could reach beyond his own sad heart to touch it. For me, every woman I find contents me, and I could be happy in remaining with any of them. In truth, I dread the leaving when it comes, not for loneliness, since love is where I go as well as where I leave, but for how the women wail for the other sailors and for me, though I believe I am too large and clumsy to be handsome. But I listen to their joys and their sorrows, you see, and am gentle with them and patient, and that pleases them. And I never take them against their will, and sometimes lie near them, only as a brother might his sister. My first woman was forced on me by the crew, and with them looking on, and it makes me blush even now to recall it. I want never to make a woman blush for anything but happiness, nor humble her unworthily or unkindly. Clement wants never to, but does, despite himself. He is sure that he has not faith enough to do right. He needs to forget what he thinks he knows, and remember what he thinks he never learned. The captain, he is worse than he thinks, and freely uses his power to bless or curse with a glance. He knows well how to rule, though he loves poorly, and it is for him that the women wail most. He wins their love and rules their wills, and will not release them when he goes, and I blush for his cruelty, though he never hurts a woman with his hands. Dominic cannot release the heart of anyone once he owns it, for anyone might be his key to lead him to the fountain of life. Why a man would seek such a thing while wishing at the same time that his own christening was undone, I cannot fathom. They that go down to the sea in ships, these see the works of the Lord, says the psalm. But Dominic sees his shadow and mistakes it for illumination. His blindness is helping Clement to kill himself little by little. But Clement stays with him for love and receives a kind of love in return, as much as Dominic knows how to give. And I stay with him, for the thing I have to do is bound to him, though this seems wondrous and strange. And I love him, and since he will not suffer that God should love him, I love him in God's place, whether he wills it or no. With this word of defiance, Brian caressed the figurehead once more and parted from her, feeling almost amid the quiet of sudden windlessness that he had heard her speak. He rescaled the shrouds of the crow's nest and looked about him. 
He loved to sleep here, gliding above the world of water, and here as elsewhere he seemed always to wake with his arms outspread to imitate the Christ in his mother's rosary, a posture which Clement recoiled to find him and Dominic cursed. It was sleep that beckoned him now, a strange, joyous sleep which prevented him from lifting his glass to behold in the flesh what his spirit prophesied. The island the ship was fast approaching. His head nodded, and he caught a glimpse, at the ship's starboard side, of a shark whose blueness was like the profoundest hue of unclouded sky. He looked to the sky and saw the shark reflected there, blue and blue swimming. And as sleep won his surrender, he heard the heaven-born motion of his fins repeating, You were born for a purpose. Chapter 5. Consummation I have strayed far, farther than the deluge was deep, and there is no way back, wailed the ship, swaying tipsily in her distress to port and starboard. Her figurehead, portrait of a love forsaken, showered the waves with salt wetness which had not sprung from them. The island opened the coral rampart of his arms, making a breach in his reef only wide enough for her to pass. The way lies forward and through me, he whispered, waiting to enfold her or watch her recede from him forever. I cannot, she moaned in agony, her planks shaking and bowing outward. If you shut your arms too soon, I will be driftwood on your sand. I cannot go forward, for there is no wind. I cannot go back, for I would burst my heart in leaving you. I cannot, I cannot, so I shall capsize, rock my mariners to a seven hundred fathom grave in an everlasting sleep. Then so might the honor bound have done, but that she felt a thing of power, a thing of holiest beauty and loveliest good brush against her. She could not see it for her tears, but at its touch its deep blueness entered her, lading her with celestial cargo, and she heard its voice murmuring softly and low, The way lies forward, take the way. And the blue that was in her answered, Yes. And there, where the hundred and twentieth meridian crosses the Tropic of Capricorn, she began with windless sails to ghost forward. Then the trade wind rose again and took the way with her, for trade is an ancient word for path. Her mariners roused themselves too late to stay the island's arms from completing their circle, and she sailed on into the Bethel of his lagoon, and there hove to. And the sun prepared to sink, to hide from dishonoring eyes the honorable end of courtship in consummation. The compass spun out of control, as though the poles of the earth had foundered and the ship now moved in obedience to the magnetism of a more tameless star. For an instant only Dominic was transfixed. Then in a flash of one dark eye's power he was above deck. He strode to the honor bound's prow and stood beside the figurehead, gazing with a hunger of fay and keen where Mariel's likeness went on before him, to a landfall he had never willed. I am Dominic, he cried, the words hastening toward their sufficiency. Night-blooming Sirius infused his lungs as the will of the secret steered him lovingly to its own place. I am Dominic, and I come. Clement felt the wood beneath his hands turn unaided, and the mist rolled away from his eyes like the scales falling from the eyes of Saul after the Damascus road. The ship was imprisoned by coral on either side, and ere the helm allowed him charge of her once more, the door in the reef had shut behind her. His heart had hardly wonder enough remaining to flutter its wings at this unnatural entry, into what deeper circle of love's inferno, into what realm of darkness masquerading as paradise overruled by what deathly queen. He sensed the entry as final, and there was a desperate beauty in that finality, from which a pure note and a steadfast word bubbled up to escape his lips and his memory as soon. Brian woke with his eyes directed heavenward and his arms cruciform. Mother, he murmured dreamily, his hand groping toward the rosary. Then all at once he remembered the swimmer in the air. Leaping to his feet, he looked to starboard and saw water rushing joyously past to meet the sunset and the shark diving and surfacing through it. Raising his spyglass to the blue of his eye, he looked ahead, and his promised purpose arrayed itself like a virgin in her wedding-day glory to greet him. Land ho! he called his happiness making it painful to speak. And as he and his captain and his chaplain sought the lagoon's center and cast out their anchor, he felt the joy of the honor bound and her gold-haired lady weaving mysteries around them. The mystery grew as, dusk deepening, 
The three deserters let down a boat and rowed quietly toward a wide, smooth beach of pebbles mingled with coral fragments, bound for adventure, high and unknown. Dominic rowed in expectation that his godlike knowledge might drown its final enemy and live forever. Clement rowed in resignation and yearned for this ferrying across the border of hope's abandonment to be his last. Brian rowed in peace and in certainty never again to weep at the wailing of women as they sped his ship away. And as night muffled the shapes of sandstone bluffs and moss-covered promontories, as the land breeze swept down the valleys and was tangled amid green tunnels, and as streamers of stardust appeared above in the wake of the waxing moon, one sight and one sound to each man was borne like an olive branch in the mouth of a dove. Brian saw a great cone spitting glowing ash, Clement saw a ring of ruins atop a high poly. Dominic saw, looming over the roof of matted trees, a monstrous banyan. These three sights they saw, and only Brian glanced away to behold the blue sea thing that guided their boat to shore. Yet to each of their hearing came a single sound, neither crashing wave nor trickling stream, nor plummeting fall, nor boiling pool. But it was the sound of running water. Chapter 6 the fountain sealed. She walked home through the rainforest, tiny ferns making a carpet for her bare feet. Flowering vines with gnarled tree trunks as their trellises formed her walls. Creeping shrugs extended their fingers, weaving nets to catch her in if she should fall. Giant ginger rose tall and red. Impatience peered up from the underwood shyly, and the gold-hued fruit of the artu gleamed faintly overhead in the dying light of day. In hundreds, the rainbow-feathered birds among the branches proclaimed night's approach, with a noise between a song and a scream. She had bidden farewell to her companions among the animals, the woolly-haired wild pigs, the tamed eels who fed from her hand, the amphibious dogs and the flying foxes who glided from treetop to treetop among the palms. She had relit the lamp before the memorial of the others, and had inspected the banyan to make certain that no purple petals strayed near its roots, and that its multiple trunks and myriad branches had not spread to further shadow the sky where the grouping of holy stars which was named the Steed of Kyalari had now begun to appear. She had bathed in the rock-bound pool, anointed her unblemished golden skin and her long black hair with coconut oil, and had gathered up her waistcloth and her shoulder scarf, dyed with the juice of mati berries, tau leaves, and the inner bark of the nono root to form red and yellow patterns of ferns and flowers. She had twined a coronal of gardenia blossoms, and placed them in her hair, and she had plucked one large rose-colored orchid, which she carried in her hand. But for these and her ear pendants, carved in delicate filigree from the tooth of a stranded sperm whale, she walked naked. She had performed in near completeness her retiring ritual, but she had not, as was her custom, paused to listen at the rocks of hearing. On the last three evenings they had communicated to her things she did not understand, and she felt that she must allow those mysteries to grow to meaning in her before she listened again. Seldom over the centuries had she striven for understanding, for it was understanding to which she was born. She was an oracle, divinely chosen, and her name, Lare, was one of the names of the goddess. When her people had found themselves hindered by riddles from fulfilling their course of life, they had come to her for guidance, and she had found it without effort to give. Always the spirit had flowed through her unimpeded. Always but during the trouble of the last generation. Of that trouble, millennia ago, she seldom thought. Her present worry over what the rocks repeated to her recalled it to her mind, but the recollection was as a, of a dream that is half forgotten before one wakes. In the last evenings the rocks had spoken to her of war and peace and of strange meshes of fortune, of freedom and destiny, and of a tide whose point of turning could not be foreknown. The words, though she could not yet understand, had begun to make a breach in her being through which the truth of them might enter when it appeared. She had not listened at the rocks today, but as she bathed she had felt a sudden painful tearing, a widening of the breach which had taken her breath, and had left her in fear for a helpless moment that she might drown. It was as once before in the pool she had felt when her heart had been breached by Kayla ages since. She had not gone down, down ever through the waters that have no ending, then or now, for now, as then, her breath had come back to her. But the breach in her remained, and she felt it waiting for that for which it waited. Now Lari emerged from the forest into the clearing, 
where a long stone's cast from the wave's highest mark upon the beach of the lagoon stood her hut and the huts of Nika and Rani. Already it was hard for her to remember days before her race had dwindled to these three. Though they often joined together for leisure or labor beneath the sun, in darkness the women chose to rest apart, for each of them encompassed secrets that could not be shared by the others. To the others, who once had walked with them and had long ago been carried away, the secrets might have been poured out, and might be poured out again, if ever the others should return. Laurie's hut was northernmost of the semicircle of three, being within a call but not a whisper of the hut of Rani. She looked towards that hut and towards the one furthest south, discerning that her sisters were already inside. Then she entered her own place of rest along a path line with pieces of black basalt and white coral. The hut was made of peely grass with palmetto for its thatching. Its floor was a fine white gravel covered with mats of pandanus. Its rafters and its central post were of a coconut wood. The rafters were twined with braided cords of various colors and draped with wreaths of sweet fern, and from the post's projections hung water bottles of black wood highly polished and baskets of green coconut fronds filled with breadfruit, plantains, vee plums. Lari drank from one of the bottles, but ate nothing, for the breach had rendered her body as hungerless as her spirit was starved. She poured water into a wooden dish and washed her feet and ankles of any uncleanness that might have clung to them on her walk from the pool. She lit her night lamp, a wick of twisted tappa floating in oil within a transparent shell, shedding soft, mystic light upon the uncanny blueness of her eyes. She positioned the lattice which was her door covering in its place and lay her body upon her tappa sheet and her head upon her pillow, whose stuffing was of the golden down of the wild thistles that grew at the southern end of the island. She did not look as she often had before sleep, to where the sea turned from emerald green to purple over the coral of sapphire blue to where the whitecaps danced beyond the reef. Twice or thrice over the not-too-distant years she had beheld the ghostly white of sails lingering there briefly and passing away. Now the mystery within her held all her attention, and the sails that did not pass but were wind-urged on were hidden from her, fluttering in the sanctuary of the lagoon by permission of her mistress alone. To her bared breast, Laurie clasped the rose-colored orchid, which once her people had known as aphrodisiac. She did not think of this now, nor, had she thought, would it have had any but the most tenuous meaning for her, for the departing of the others was beyond the reaches of all but her rarest visions. She could remember nothing of what the others were, but that they had been beautiful. In their days, language had flowed differently, and Kyalari herself had not been the same had been more like the others who were gone and less like those who now remained. Lari's own beauty had little meaning for her, though she unselfconsciously acknowledged it on the occasions when her reflection was cast back to her from some still watery surface. Her flesh was not so ample as Ronnie's, nor her stature imposing as Nika's, yet there was no great flaw in her but for the scar that curved across her throat, a remainder of a wound from the time of trouble. With the inflicting of that wound, she had passed beyond mere oracle to something of more awe, for the spirit that once had wafted through her and been gone in a moment had then begun to make in her a part of its resting place. Her scar was distinct, but it did not spoil her beauty, did not tempt the disesteem of those who looked on her as did her eyes that were of no eye's color that has otherwhere been seen. Some few among her people had possessed blue eyes and half-fair hair, but Laurie's eyes were not that blue of palely tinted rivulets or limpid skies, but deep, deep blue as the waters of the fountain which bore their own light within them and sacrificed nothing of their brilliance to other light. The eyes of Laurie were beautiful, but they were wrenching. As from the fountain sprang health and life, so from her eyes, wrenching another's weakness, there had sprung violence and death. From the darkness outside the hut came an explosion of thunder, but neither its noise nor that of the drenching rains which followed disturbed her repose. Even through thunder and rain she had heard it clearly, for there was no place upon the island where ears could shut it out. From the jungle of the banyan, to the profaning ring of the poly, to the desolation about the cone, there echoed the sound of the fountain waters running. And now, with a surprise that was lulled by impending sleep, she smelled a smell that was partner to that sound, one she had not inhaled since the way to the fountain had been sealed. It was the smell of night blooming Sirius, blooming only around the fountain and blooming always, for it was always night where the fountain welled underground. 
How should that fragrance now come to her, unless it were that the fountain had loosed its seal in concert with the breaching of her soul? Yet once more she saw it and failed to understand, and her lips parted in a slumberous prayer for enlightenment. O Kyalare, majesty unseen, will you guide us to the fountain again? Will we have need of it? Will there come to me he that is meant, the offspring of your honored word? Will I live to see the messenger of the water? Will I live to see ever your messenger of the fire? Or will the banyan find its food and shadow all the moon's light at last, spread a curtain of death which the cone will baptize with ash and flame? Will the rains that do not end return, and the curse of the crossing claim new flesh? Or will you take us to yourself finally and tenderly upon the joy-bound heavenly wave? What will be, Kyalari, what will be? What will come from beyond the reef to fill this breach which in me you have made? Lare slept, and a dream began to take her, in which a white cloth was thrown over her by one unlike her, and she was led to a sanctuary whose purpose she could not recall. And the spirit of the fountain that lived in her was released from its virgin seal by way of a mystery, and she was broken open, and all the waters rushed forth from her in a perfection of joy. At the coming of that joy, even amid her sleep, she trembled, till upon the trembling there was cast a sudden shadow, and the dream released her. Light of the waxing moon shone through her door lattice upon her, and it was tainted with a fragment of night robed in strange flesh. Lari opened her eyes. Though still misted over with sleep, they took knowledge of the lattice being lifted away and of a form of humanity passing from misshapen dimness into the light circle of her night lamp. Then, though she woke, she thought she dreamed yet. The being who approached her through the circle was other. She thought for a long moment that it was Kayla, and shuddered at the thinking. But though the being's hair was black, it was braided behind as none of her people's hair had worn, and though the eyes were dark, their vision was of things neither Kayla nor his brothers had beheld. His brothers. The words of the others now flooded back to her as if they had not been lost. He, the man, was a stranger dressed in strange clothes, soaked through by the rain, born of a strange woman, for now also Lara remembered birth. Had Kayla's life flame indeed been rekindled from the faraway past to burn dangerously before her, it would have been alien. But this man was strange beyond that strangeness, and his strangeness ran to fill her breach while the rainwater ran from him to kiss the mats beneath his booted feet. She wished to speak to him, but found no words, as if the language had been changed a second time, and she must grope for its meaning anew. She felt both a great fear and a deep exultation, and there was nothing she could do for either deepness but to wait. Kailari, what have you brought me? What visitation beyond my imagining have you willed? Then the stranger came fully between her and the light of the lamp and moon, and the strange tenderness in his hands was a strange pain that caused her to cry softly within her throat. The hands passed over her scar, both accentuating it and making her feel that it had been effaced. The dark eyes flinched as they met with the blueness of her own, and she read dark thoughts in them before they turned quickly away. The stranger himself did not turn, but drew nearer, and nothing was as she had imagined, yet all was as it was meant. And at the last he spoke strange words to her, and she felt the breach no more. Remembering what secrets of shape and color she had seen in his eyes, she spoke words to him in return. A cry of shock and pain broke from him, and his hand struck her. The fountain's access sealed itself again. When next Lare woke to see him lying by her, the light that revealed him was not of her lamp, but of the dawn. Chapter 7. Baptism Dominic set his foot upon the shore. The Polynesian night, fully fallen now, held its breath. Cat's paws ceased to ruffle the lagoon's surface. The birds among the branches turned from screeching to silence. An eerie halo unwound the moon and the stars of the southern seas bowed their heads. Through the stillness Dominic heard the waters running. His seeking spirit understood at once what waters they were. A new perception made itself felt in him, the nearest he had known to humility. His triumph at coming within one final prayer's approach of his object was subdued by a tranquil weariness. Sleep seemed the waters to sing to him. Take your rest in assurance that all is done. Walking slowly and quietly to just above the reach of the tide, he bent his knees, desiring the ground for his bed. Strangest of all landfalls was this, in thirteen revolutions around the sun. 
Strangely, he had not carried from the honor bound his sea chest and its resident weapons of a seasoned sorceress warrior. Strangely, too, he felt no need nor even any superfluity of want for a woman. Always he had come ashore in a conqueror's weeds, claiming the booty of flesh before a second night's descending. Always it had been easy. He had never, like Clement, employed the mildest bodily force to win a woman, for the power of his person had taken for him whatever he wished by the will of the giver. What force he used was a force of the motions and mind, and while his chaplain might seek repentance and tears whenever he slightly strayed over the boundary of rape, Dominic expended no pang of conscience in considering whether wills won by such means as his own were truly free. He had never laid hands on a woman that she had not pleaded to have laid on her, though his calculation of word, look, and touch had hooked into untold hearts and wrested them from their moorings, never to be re-anchored. Women had proved inestimable to him in his search, of much greater value than the men whose wisdom he had sounded. But they were tools, purposeful victims like the crucified Jew of Brian's childish admiration, unworthy of friendship or respect. He invaded their lives and left them again as an enigma, discovering all but revealing nothing, and never once had he allowed a woman to set foot aboard his ship. He would go to them, but never might they come to him. Their love for him formed the wards to fit the secret's lock, but his love for the secret were eternally beyond them. With the secret now so near, a woman's gift could add nothing to the celebration of his soul. The song of the waters was for him a complete prelude to sleep and a sufficient lullaby. And yet, there was a pride in him that was ashamed to neglect any assertion of itself before the men who called him captain, and there was a long habit in him of resisting the failure to act. He looked to the clearing before him where, beneath the eaves of a rainforest, stood three native huts with their night lamps glimmering. The perfume of night-blooming Sirius worked on his senses like a morphine drug. Yet it seemed to him that it should rather speed his blood like mercury. Though the waters appeared to bid him rest, he felt that lethargy did his worship of them no honor. The mantle of his self-fixed identity was upon him. Though he could choose to let it fall free, he would not choose so. His knees straightened, and he took a step toward the northernmost hut, for it was from the north and west that the watery music flowed. At his footfall, a drum roll of thunder overwhelmed the music so that it was almost lost. The tail of his eye caught the footfalls of Brian and Clement beside him, the former directed straight toward the westward, the latter toward the south. Unfolding petals of one tripartite flower, the sailors followed the blessings of light and heat their separate ways, sudden rain sealing their clothing to them and nearly blinding them. Through the darkling rain, Dominic traced the notes of the song along the coral-strewn path, the moon smiting through the downpour to strike his back, he gripped a lattice-work door and removed it from its place. He entered into a circle of light, smelled the smell of coconut oil, orchid, and gardenia interlacing the night-blooming Sirius, and looked upon the woman to whom he would bind himself after the manner of all earth. Upon a sheet of tapa she lay naked, a rose orchid between her breasts. Her eyes, newly roused from dreams, widened to receive the sight of him as slowly he approached her. Her body was counterpart to his own in frailness, a woman's and yet half a child's, but her beauty was not undeserving of him. He dashed the rain water from his face and cast his clinging shirt from him. The water's anthem grew ever more insistent, seeming to beckon him from just where she lay. Briefly he closed his eyes and listened to the voice of the secret whose unveiling ecstasy drove him to his knees in almost surrender. Opening his eyes again, he let them run with the rhythm of the waters over the girl woman. They paused at a scar upon her throat, and he fingered the scar in mingling of curiosity, pity, and desire to reach into the breach of the scar defined and beyond it. Then his fingers ran to where she clutched the orchid, and his eyes to hers. The eyes of her were fully open now, imperative whirlpools intent upon his submerging. He reeled at their color and at their knowledge, eyes that had gazed on time and worlds more than he would ever see or understand, in which his selfhood sank with as little fanfare as an earth-sized scrap of jetsam in a universal sea. The thought came to him, which he could not thrust away, that the woman was the fountain, that to learn the secret he must learn to bow to her as its hierophant, and to the spirit stream that issued through her as though a flame in an unyielding rock. Bow he would not, for there were teachings within that stream he would have no part of, that would drown his power forever once immersed. Patience for the wails of a woman and bastard children, 
gallows to which throats were willingly given, catechism paid for in blood. Scarlet ropes paid out to their endings, from which clung by a fiber the reflection he cast in her eyes and she cast back to him. Sick with horror, he turned away, and never again that night, though his eyes drank in the whole remainder of her, did he seek her eyes again. His lust quickened even as his truth love faded. He wrestled like Jacob with the angel to know the secret as he would know it and not as it would be known. Himself the godhead of his sole belief, he proclaimed him the victor, while the spirit of the fountain baptized him as heedless of his discretion as a babe's. Spending himself in the woman at last, he avowed his creed, I am Dominic. Letting his head sink to her breast, he appended in a whisper, Whom the gods have blessed. The canticle of the waters was loud in his ears, and their christening rested on his skin in the form of sweat. Through them came the woman's voice, hushed yet distinct. He understood her words, for they were nearly those of the Tahitians, but there was a variance in them of accent and intonation, and a sense of having run to their meaning by different channels. We have a daughter, Dominic. I have named her Scarlet. I who will curse you am Kyalari. Crying against the prophetic spirit that possessed her, he struck her hard across the face. Her words failed, and she fainted and slept. Dominic stared at the hand that had struck, wondering at its violence, and before his eyes it grew mangled and twisted like the limb of an evil tree. He clenched the words he had heard in the hand and strangled them to forgetfulness and the outpouring whine of night-blooming Sirius was stopped, and the waters dwindled to the razor edge of silence. He recalled no song of curse or blessing as he felt asleep, in the arms of strange women, in the embrace of the fountain of life, in the arms of Mariel in dreams, he could not tell. Chapter 8. Two and Two Southward Clement walked through the fury of the rain. A succession of thunderclaps teased him with a revelation he could not translate, constant as the heart of God and noble as his city. As a man condemned to be beheaded cannot tear his eyes from the sight of the black hood and axe, so Clement's gaze was riveted in doomful fascination on the hut before him and its will-o'-the-wispish light. It was hell's unremitting fire, not the benign radiance of the new Jerusalem that waited for him there. In crossing that threshold he would give over for good the hope of heaven here and hereafter. He went willingly to his executioner, for beyond this one final love's illusion he could endure no more. Falling water so assailed him with the force of the wind that he could scarcely breathe. In his artist's imagination he was a deep sea diver, and the hut he fought the rain walls to reach was a giant mollusk whose tight-shut shell concealed a perfect pearl. Could he but keep his lungs from bursting till he coaxed the shell open, he might possess that precious purity. But the words of the wise king and unhappy lover, David's son, fell from his lips vainly as they had once on the ears of a woman of Cape Town, her of Bora Bora, the maids of the New Hebrides and the China Sea. A garden enclosed is my sister, my spouse, a spring shut up, a fountain sealed. Open to me, my sister, my love, my dove, my undefiled, for my head is filled with dew, and my locks with drops of the night. Lack of oxygen to his brain began to lower a curtain of darkness. He grasped at the hut's door lattice as helplessly as ever he had grasped a helm. He stumbled into the hut, heaving for air, prepared to face the Circe of his last transmogrification. She sat with legs crossed upon a pandanus mat, weaving a chain of burgundy flowers by the light of her night lamp. Beside her lay a finished circlet of white moss roses, mate to a crown upon her head. Though he had entered with a clumsy noise, and though the sharp intake of his breath on seeing her expelled itself in a moan, she did not look up till she had linked the last of her heap of blossoms, two remaining, then one. When the chain was done, she raised her head, as though she had expected him. Her eyes conveyed no surprise, but only unheard yearning and fetterless pleasure. He that is meant she whispered in a tongue of Polynesia, inquiring of some presence he could not see. Then her features settled into a smile of affirmation. Yes, he. She stood, and at once he knew her, her flower diadem of richer majesty than gold. Bearing her artwork of blooms, she walked toward him, her lithe Amazonian height at one with his. Perfect was the pearl indeed, the queen of pearls unshadowed by the universal blight of men descended from Shem, Ham, or Japheth, 
a remnant of splendor from the time before heaven's wrath broke loose, when waters of tenderness yet swaddled the firmament above and below. Clement stood unstirring as she placed the circlet upon his head and wound the chain around his waist. Binds roses white upon my brow, my waist with a sash of burgundy. Then freezing and searing him at once, she laid her maiden hand in his. As she led him across the hut to a bed of passion and peace, Clement's mind groped again to echo Solomon's song of love for his own dark-skinned queen. But the words he found instead were St. Stephen's to those who martyred him. Behold, you despisers, and wonder and perish, for I work a work in your days, a work in which ye shall in no wise believe, though a man declare it unto you. The work had been worked. The wonder was declared to him by the herald of his eyes and skin. Doubting Thomas had probed the sacred wounds with his fingers. He had felt himself hated of God, had known his heart as the decaying ruins of a temple rejected by the one it desired as inhabitant. He had judged himself forever drowning among the mateless. And now this. And now this. As he laid his body down with hers, one with one, and to one tending, a prayer sprang from him, which seemed to have its source in another man, neither Jonah of his father nor his mother's Clement. Forgive me, good Christ, forgive me. Brian breasted the storm without struggle, straight before to westward as his purpose drew him. He was hardly aware that he walked, still less to what place. The spirit of the island had owned him at once, and he offered himself to it in joy at every step, a virgin sacrifice flinging itself without coercion into molten fire. His mind retraced itself to its pristine state, free of any first memory of pain, and his flesh felt itself renewed as though it had known no lust nor known the need to know. Trance-like, he entered the hut, whose door lattice had been left ajar, and journeyed through blissful light till his eyes were distracted by the form of a voluptuous woman lying asleep. Nearly his infant newness faltered, and almost the man in him forgot the child to the disgrace of his wiser part. Then the child in him recognized the child in her, and reached forth the hand of kinship. No, he whispered gently, shaking his head, I'll not awake her, but I'll keep God's place beside her till she wakes. He lowered himself to the earth, and stretched out his arms to anticipate the morning. Love is where I go. Wait for me, mother. Sleep carried him away effortlessly, as the ebb tide bears the souls of the dead. Chapter 9 Discord of Bells Pink trickled inward from the edges of the clouds, then ran to fiery red, as the sun's gem of glory arose over where the trade winds drove the waves tumultuously upon the reef. Within her hut, Laurie woke, and turned her bruised cheek toward Dominic. She watched as dreams of power rippled across his face, and she saw where the spirit of the fountain had streamed from her to carve out its channels in him, invisible to all but her. We have a daughter, Dominic. I have named her Scarlet. I who will curse you am Kaya Lare. By the fruit of her own lips, Lare was made desolate, medium of a malediction she did not comprehend. The goddess had permitted that this other should bind her to him, and had cursed him in the same hour. Therefore, through that binding, she also was cursed. Hers was the joy of surrender, and she would joy even in her mistress's wrath as it was loosed upon her mate, if she must. Yet in one thing she could not take joy, for him to awake, behold her surrender, and, despising it, wish it undone. In the last generation she had become acquainted with the spectrum of suffering, but this new hue of pain she would not suffer yet. She rose and left him, carrying her clothing with her, and went to commune with Kaya Lare among the southern craters and cinders. Dominic woke soon after her to the rushing of waters that receded further from him with his every straining to hear them more nearly. Theirs was no longer the sweetness of song but the salt of seduction, and the memory of the perfume that had accompanied them yester eve was an acid taste in his mouth. He rose, downed a draught from one of Lare's water bottles, and walked to the door of the hut from which he gazed upon the glittering blueness of the lagoon. There he saw the honor bound, secure in her berth, aloof from his captaincy, as though he had never ruled her. She put him in mind that there was something he missed, a thing she guarded and must give up to him. The lagoon's color prevented his naming it, for Blue returned his thought to wrenching eyes, and from them the shape of noose, shade of scarlet. Across miles and years, Mariel had reached forth to damn him in a voice of deity. He had killed the god with a blow of his hand, 
for it was not for such a voice that he had come here, not for its sake that he was he. He stepped from the hut into the island sun, and, squinting, turned his eyes southward. Emerging from the hut nearest him came Brian, hand in hand with a native girl. The girl was naked upwards from the waist, Brian shirtless and barefoot with his breeches rolled to the knee. The unselfconscious pleasure that radiated from them seemed a thing too innocent to be sincere except among very young children, and for a moment Dominic's paternal tenderness towards Brian extended itself to embrace the girl. The moment passed quickly, for as his eyes fully took her in, he knew that this one, among all women, he could never love as daughter. Whatever gods there were had formed her for desire. Slow black lashes, circling wide eyes where passions rode the surface, tangle of sable hair lying upon olive skin in thick waves, nostrils that caressed what air they took, lightly pouting lips, full and perfect breasts. He had stayed amid the gardens of many latter-day eves, snatching them from the hand of chance and holding their allegiance fast. In one moment the whole wealth of that possession became nothing to him, and his greed released them to flutter free. This Adam's rib of Polynesia among them all was the key he sought. Through the use of her he would know the secret, and take pleasure in the finding and pride in knowing such as he had never taken. Dominic knew suddenly what it was he had missed, what he had left behind him in confused purposefulness when he had come ashore. The girl returned his gaze. He saw that the line of desire he had cast had caught and held, and drew her desiring back to him. Brian had been speaking to her. Noticing her distraction, he looked to Dominic, then gently guided her away. But Dominic saw how reluctant were her eyes to turn again. Shifting his intent toward a thing he could act on without delay, he strode down to the sand where the boat was beached. Nearby it sat Clement with a wreath of white roses withering upon his head, watching the grace of a woman's limbs swing. "'Good day, Captain,' he said, without turning. Dominic followed the motions of the swimmer inquisitively. "'How is it with her, Clement?' he asked, his voice softening with love of his friend and pity for his trouble. The chaplain did not answer at once. When at last he did so, it was in a voice more firm and yet more undefended than Dominic had heard from him. Do not ask me to speak of her. A mistaken word may loose her miracle and carry it away. Though no woman could mean that to him, Dominic, knowing his own joy in the secret, in some measure understood. I am glad for you, he said truthfully. Then in a changed tone he added, I am taking the boat, Clement, back to the ship. When we came ashore yesternight, I left my sea chest aboard her. Now Clement did turn from the swimmer to look askance at him. Wizards that peep and that mutter, he said under his breath, will you bring my mandolin with you as well? They'll make a feast in our honor tonight. And Brian would be happy, I know, if you would bring his book to him. Brian, replied Dominic strangely, has every reason to be happy enough. But I'll bring what you ask, Clement, or would you care to row with me? Clement turned back to the swimmer. No, Dominic, I'll not row with you. Dominic launched the boat, and after many strokes of the oars, he boarded the honor bound. Something moved him before going below to walk to the ship's prow and linger beside the figurehead which invested her with Mariel's character and ghost. He gazed toward the island, and it seemed to him that a shadow crossed between his eyes and it, a warning of danger or a premonition of death. He was shaken with a sense that the deck upon which he stood was no longer his own, and that the island would never be his with whatsoever skill he courted it. Yet its aquatic treasure would bestow richness upon his soul none the less. Descending into the belly of the ship, he sought out Clement's mandolin. He carried it to his cabin, and wrapped it in the coat of his uniform, and placed it among his own art's instruments. Then hoisting his sea chest onto his narrow shoulders, he ascended again to the deck. As he went, he remembered Brian's book, but he did not go back for it. Not far from the three huts, through the rainforest, there was another clearing, the place of jubilation of the people of Lare, Rani, and Nika. That place had not been used since before Nika was born, in the days of Rani's and Lare's youth, ere the others laid their world waste. Though the women had had cause for giving thanks during the intervening years, their celebrations had been simple and subdued. But through the years they had kept the place cleared, if perchance the reasons of livelier feasts, courting, wedding, mating, and birth, should be theirs again. Tonight, the place was to reenact its long-neglected purpose. The women, permitting no help, made ready to do their mate's honor with an offering of the fruits of harvest. The men wandered a little about the island near the lagoon, but did not go further afield. 
Even Dominic, in his eagerness to trace the waters running to their source, felt a disinclination to venture far. Venture he would, but the time was not yet. There was a thing that troubled him, and troubled the others, though they had not spoken of it. Now, as the sun attained its noon zenith, the three sat near a cluster of coconut palms, watching as the women scaled them by means of pieces of bark secured to their ankles. Dominic, ever the first to seek, gave the trouble voice. Clement, are there any but these upon the island? I had thought perhaps they had been separated from their tribe, as dedicated virgins or in punishment for the breaking of some taboo, but now I am not sure. If they have a people, they show no intention of informing them of our coming, and they behave in all ways as though they were sufficient unto themselves. Have your women spoken to you of others? Brian looked pensive, but remained silent. It was clear to him that Dominic had avoided inquiring of his own woman, and he had said nothing at all of his night with her, and did not look at her. Brian noted by contrast the manner in which his captain looked at Ronnie. He had seen that look in Dominic's eyes before, though never directed toward a woman not his. It had been a point of honor among the crew never to meddle with other men's women, and Dominic had bowed to that scruple as well as the rest. It was Clement who spoke, his eyes never leaving Nika, as they had not left her longer than an instant since their awakening to her. "'I think that there are no others. I asked Nika while you were aboard the ship. Where were her people?' "'Lare and Ronnie were her people,' she answered. "'Surely there are more of you,' said I. "'Where are the others?' She pointed to me, to the honor-bound, and to the palms where Brian walked with his woman. "'You are the others.' Then I thought perhaps the women had been abandoned here, or that their people had died of disease or in battle. Are the others dead? I asked, and she answered, Yes. How long have they been gone? Here she shook her head as if she were uncertain. One went, she said, and then another. I cannot remember them all. But the others, those like you, died when the rain came. This told me nothing, for it rains upon these islands every evening without fail. So I asked, which rain? How long ago? The long rain. Long ago. The rain drowned the others. Of what kind was the rain? I asked then, beginning to suspect superstition of distorting the truth of a tidal wave or a flood, though Nika seems beyond deceiving. I do not know, she answered. I was not yet. She looked at me strangely, and I understood that she was telling me I was the first man she had seen. Dominic was fascinated. It sounds like another legend of the deluge. What of your woman, Brian? Has she spoken of this? Brian, marking how Dominic hesitated over the words, your woman, looked at his captain sharply as his peaceful nature allowed. He shook his head. You are blind, Dominic, without mistaking, or you would know plain how it is. And you, Clement, have the most reason to know, for it was you that taught me. A legend of the deluge? No, Captain, it's no heathen foolishness about Ruahatu and his revenge on the fisher folk you've stumbled upon this time. The long rain, long ago. Are you so dim-sighted that you cannot see it in their eyes? See what in their eyes? Dominic asked, beginning to see, but not yet believing. The years, Dominic, all the years. Then Dominic's mind raised the objection. But if it truly happened, it was millennia ago. How could the women still live? and his mind, more than that of any man living, knew how. His eyes took fire with renewed obsession, pyres of witches no deluge could quench. The waters, Clement, can you hear them? Do you hear, Brian? The waters of life. The second night had fallen. Lights of armor nuts, strung upon fibers that traversed the branches of trees, burned one by one with fitful bluish flame, till the oil in each was exhausted and the next ignited. In the place of jubilation, the six feasters half sat and half lay in reticence of satiety, alternately speaking a few words and then drifting towards slumber. Brian sighed contentedly, remembering the salt pork, oatmeal, and dried peas of his early days as a midshipman. In all his sojourn among the islands, he had partaken of no meal with greater relish than this. There had been breadfruit, roasted in an odoriferous fire of sandalwood, brown without, cream-colored within, rolls of baked paste of yams, sweet plums, plantain pudding, and guava jelly. There had been grated young coconut meat mixed with its own milk, and there had been confections made of treacle of palm sap from the heart of a tree. He had drunk flour-tinctured water out of a tamanu wood bowl leaning upon Ronnie's breast. 
Animals that joined in their celebration, capering before them and causing them to laugh. Woolly pigs, each with its own name, gorged themselves on leftover plums and tossed coconuts in frustrated attempts to crack them open. Flying foxes traveled tirelessly between the clearing's bordering trees. Amphibious dogs forsook the water to dance in their midst. He and his shipmates and their new mistresses had laughed and had feasted, Vare offering the first fruits to a deity of whom he had not heard, though Dominic evinced recognition at the name. The women had served them, though they did not, as was the custom among other Polynesians, sit apart from the men while they ate. Clement of them all had laughed least, and Brian knew that it was not from any dearth of happiness, but from an overrunning cup of it. The faithless heart had called out to the heart of beauty, and she had answered him in word and note. Today was the day after the dark night of his soul, and its promise was no dream. Ronnie reclined beside Brian, talking with him pleasantly, though her eyes turned often toward his captain even as she spoke. What his relations would be with this woman he could not tell, but he had known upon setting his foot ashore that here life began for him anew, that he would act otherwise than he had acted until he acted his purpose, and would rest here forever. What Ronnie would be to him he did not know, but he knew that he would never leave her, though his fellow deserters should affirm themselves so once again. Dominic, whom prolonged laziness made uncomfortable, interrupted his thought. "'Tell us a story, Brian, before we succumb to sleep. Or say a psalm or a parable,' amended Clement, his head in Nika's lap. "'Aye, that I can,' answered Brian, a bit reluctantly, for he would have been more happy to sleep than to make himself a spectacle before the women. "'It will have to be a thing I know from memory, seeing as I have not got the book.' Dominic indicated his sea-chest against which he leaned. I have a book here, he said, referring to the desecrated Bible, and at once wondered why he had said it, knowing that it would seem a deliberate insult to Brian's belief. Brian swallowed, but his voice betrayed no offense. No, Dominic, I think I'll not read from that. He rummaged in his mind for verses he knew by rote, those dealing with ships in the sea, the crucifixion, the beatitudes. Then he lighted on a sudden inspiration. I believe, he said, I will choose the tale of Noah, told in my own words and so the women can understand. He began to speak carefully in Tahitian. It happened long ago, when Teata, man, had begun to spread all over the earth. In those days there were some men as tall as giants, renowned and mighty, and in those days men lived to be nine hundred years old and more, and there were Varwa Inno, fallen angels, who chose wives among the human women against the way of nature, and Atua, God, was displeased. And he was displeased with men, because men everywhere were growing wicked and violent. And he wished that he had not made men at all, and he vowed that he would rid the earth of them and make his creation clean. But there was one man, Noah, whom God spared, because Noah walked as near to God as men do in their own hearts. And God told Noah how he purposed to destroy the earth by a flood, and told him to build a great boat, an ark we call it, and to enter in with his wife and his sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth, and their wives, and with two of every animal there is, male and female, and every kind of food, for to preserve the good of his creation for when the world would start anew. So Noah built the ark, and he and his family entered into it, and the animals came two and two, and God shut the doors of the ark after them, and it began to rain, and the fountains under the sea began to spout, and heaven poured God's wrath from its windows, and the waters over and under the firmament were let loose upon the wickedness of man. And it rained for forty days and forty nights, and the tallest of the mountains was covered over, and everything upon the earth but Noah and his kin and the animals with them drowned. The rain stopped, but the water continued to rise, and it covered the earth for a hundred and fifty days. Then God had pity on Noah, and brought a wind that made the waters ebb. And Noah sent out doves to test the waters, and one came back empty, and the second bore an olive branch, and the third never returned. Then Noah opened the ark and looked out and saw that the ground was dry. And Noah and his family and the animals came out of the ark. And Noah built an altar and made offerings upon it to God. And God told them to be fruitful and multiply and to do justice in the earth, blood paying for blood. And he promised that he would never bring another flood. And he set a bow in the cloud, a rainbow, as a sign of his promise, so that men might look on it and not fear the rain again. Brian ended. If there had remained to him any doubt of his perception of these women in their past, it was dispelled. At his first mention of the rain, Ronnie had grown pale and trembled, and Nika, breathing deeply, had taken her hand. The strange blue eyes of Laurie, where she sat near but not touching Dominic, 
wept such tears as are not shed for strange griefs. Dominic, from the corner of his eye, saw the tears, and saw more intently the trembling of Ronnie. He looked for the women to follow Brian's lead, and tell their own truer tale. He saw Nika look to Clement, Ronnie half to Brian and half to himself, and then both women to Lare, who shook her head and whispered, Not yet. She is their oracle, then, he observed, and it is she who will have the most knowledge of the fountain. But my own knowledge will come by more alluring means. The pride of his knowing being risen in him, he determined that it was his moment to contribute to the feast of flesh and spirits. To the discomfort of Clement and Brian, he opened his sea chest, turning it slightly to display its contents towards Ronnie, away from Lare. He unwrapped the mandolin from the coat of his uniform and handed it to Clement, who took it gingerly as though he feared witchery might have possessed it by proximity. After some thought, Dominic removed three things from the chest and laid them on his outspread coat. The multiplying stones, the seeds reputed to be from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, and the singing shell. While the women watched curiously, Dominic brought two of the stones together till they touched. Presently, though the method of its happening could not precisely be seen, four smaller stones appeared nestled between the original pair, two identical to one parent and two to the other. Nika and Ronnie expressed mild amazement, though Lari did not, and Dominic performed the experiment once more, his eyes locked with the eyes of Ronnie as the stones mated. Next he passed from hand to hand the singing shell. Brian refused to listen or even to touch it. The devil had nothing to tell him he cared to know, thank you, Captain. Clement, in spite of himself, could not refrain from listening briefly till the unearthly wailing of the shell's hellish inhabitant quick froze his heart, and he let it fall from his ear. Nika listened and passed the shell on, looking puzzled as if what she heard neither moved her for ill or good. Ronnie cried out, but listened for a long while under Dominic's scrutiny. Lare, to whom Dominic gave the shell last, held it for a moment, then dropped it without having listened, nursing her palm as though she had been burned. Lastly, Dominic took between his thumb and forefinger the seed descended from Eden. He spoke words to it, unintelligible to the others, and soon the seed began to bud and blossom like the rod of Aaron, serpentine vines and carnivorous flowers of every imaginable color. They filled the air with lethal perfume, then evaporated into nothingness like the illusion they were. Brian, who hated Dominic's magic, blurted out, And can you make your travesty of a book sprout the pages it's wanting? Then, I beg your pardon, Dominic, he blushed and sank into a moody silence. Dominic looked at Brian through narrowed eyes, smiled satirically, and returned in a tone which implied a broader meaning. No pardon needed. Then, seeing that the women had gathered to the place a native flute and drums, he said, Will the women dance for us? Nika? Ronnie? Ronnie rose, and Dominic positioned the drums beneath his hands. Will you play the flute for her, your lady, Brian? You play well, and Clement cares for nothing but his own instrument. Brian shook his head and turned it away, wanting not to see the performance that would follow. But he could not avoid seeing in the periphery of his vision that Dominic had taken the pandanus leaf wreath of taboo from his sea chest and given it to Ronnie as a headdress in which to dance. He goes too far, farther than I have seen him, he thought and I know now what is bound to be. I was a fool not to know sooner that honor among deserters is shallow honor, and especially that of a man who will cringe at nothing to gain the power he worships. It is the next step hellward for him, this stealing of other men's women. When she dances, it will be for Dominic. No, I'll not play for her or watch her, but his own woman that he is discarding will watch, and she will hurt, worse than I, for she'll hurt for herself as well as for him and his victim while I have no jealousy left in me to be wounded. If I had taken Ronnie last night, instead of only lying by her, she might not have gone over to him, for she remembers from all those years ago that there is more between a woman and a man than I have given her yet. But I'll not ask pardon for my restraint, though it is despised. Ronnie could never have been mine, not in that way. I will never make merchandise of a woman any more, for my purpose will not allow it again. I cannot stop Dominic from using Ronnie to wreak his fiendish magic, or from breaking Laurie's heart or sending himself to damnation, but I may yet have a thing to do for him before the end. Ronnie danced to the music of drum alone, and Dominic knew as he drummed that she danced for him. While he watched her, he began to trace the subtle cracks in her 
into which he might creep. How unlike Lare, impermeable stone, was she. The gold of Lare's skin was tepid between the olive heat, the jarring blue eyes an abomination before the stirring dark, the rigid straightness of hair blasphemous to the tangled waves that rolled. The fullness of Ronnie's flesh made Lare in her delicacy appear as though she were wasting away unto death. He did not look to Lare to make the comparison, but he remembered the scar upon her throat by which the throat of Ronnie was not disfigured. No scar seemed Ronnie, but cracks, and as he traced them, his trained occultist's eye perceived spirits anointing her headdress with flame, like the cloven tongues of the Holy Ghost upon the disciples at Pentecost. Sensual and immediate was Ronnie, Lare ethereal and remote. Lare's strength he could not breach, while Ronnie's weakness would become his own strength to imbibe the most inebriating strength of all. He genuflected to that weakness, all its thousands of years in preparation, and saw it slip in time with the motions of Ronnie's swaying hips into his hand. Clement, too, saw it slip, and he saw the hand shut. If in the rapture in which his heart now lived he could have cursed anything, it would be that his exalting and his captain's degradation had converged upon one shore. Amid his new peace he discovered in himself a new concern for other men's peace, as though his chaplain's office were not, after all, a travesty, but the task to which he had rightly been called. Brian David had no need of him, for since having landed upon this incarnate memory of paradise, the boy was more than ever heaven's own. But Dominic, what could he do for Dominic? Impervious to preaching, yet the captain was vulnerable if one knew where to prick. The devil, the proud spirit, cannot endure to be mocked. And he, Clement, had needles with which to probe that Dominic knew not of, for Dominic had unwittingly made him his confessor. Frank with regard to his spiritual lust, yet there are things of the heart's history Dominic kept close. Clement had seen the disturbance in his eyes when they had glanced upon the figurehead, when one spoke to him of sins as scarlet, and Clement had heard things from his lips that he had meant never to speak or form in thought, for Dominic was an unquiet sleeper, wandering in his sleep, his dreams speaking through him. The seeker hated all dreams he could not command, and Clement knew why. Knowing and caring for his captain's soul, he chose to do a thing more daring than he had done, a thing that might strangle his friend's mortal love for him. He had planned, when his turn to advance the celebration came, to sing a hymn or a song of love which, once composed in want, would now be performed in fulfillment. Instead he chose a song he had written for Dominic, one for which Dominic had no knowledge and might never forgive. Ronnie ceased her dance and took her seat again, nearer Dominic than Brian now. Clement struck a chord, his mandolin's strings tinkling like tambourines, ringing outward and returning like bells. Green have been the valleys, and long the road between them lie. Through forest barring all return, to green seen through a young man's eye. Across the beaches of black sand, the virgin islands born of fire. Their coral reefs, their painted shells, and native daughters' warm desire. Through bazaars of Persia and Japan, of India and Araby, where merchants of the Orient hawk jade and ginger jasmine tea, silk and spice and carven treasures, cedar, teak and ebony, cardamom and sesame, sandalwood and ivory. She wore a robe of ashen gray, with silver bells sewn on its hood, that warned the creatures of the night she'd come to call within the wood. Maria was my lady named, she was the darling of my heart. I was the apple of her eye, Whose tainted core forced us to part. Ringlets that cascaded down, a cape of periwinkle blue, 
stockinged feet and mittened hands that gathered lilac sprigs and you she gave too much i could not stay nor bear the burnt nor make an end without a word i went from her who was my god speed and god send at the name of Mariel, Dominic jerked and gasped as though he had been shot. His tenebrous eyes grew yet more dark with bitterness and wrath, his hand clenching till its nails drew blood. The four winds and the seven seas nurtured me like I was their own, then flung me as a castaway before a queen upon her throne who trafficked with the darker powers and played the whore with souls of men and made me drunk on martyr's blood though i would fain have turned again astride a many horned beast Sat she who weaned me from the breast To feed on spoiling innocence Full ripened sin vain glorious quest I cut my teeth upon her flesh And sucked out from beneath the rind The savage lust, the senseless rage the dross and dregs of humankind. Mother of harlots, claw me numb, devour me that I may forget the softest skin against my hands, the blending breath, the mingled sweat. Let Mary ill not pray for me, if yet the hills do harbor her, nor pray to God that I should change, who never can nor will ever. I've drunken from life's chalice long, both sacrament and sacrilege, the holy and the most profane. The broadsword and the razor's edge. Still the lips of no sweet messenger Have troubled me like Mariel's. And even as the ripples fade, I hear the sound of silver bells. The strings in their wedded words fell silent, but the spirit of bells lingered, chiming the dead years, tolling loss. Dominic's eyes upon the singer were as unforgiving as he had known they must be. Though the song in the men's native tongue forbade the women's understanding, the tension of its ringing held them also. Six networks of nerves thrilled at the edge of transport or tragedy, violence or vision. Then the tautness relaxed, and Nika sang. Clement forgot Dominic in all but one voice. It was a wordless, native chant that welled from her throat, more ecstatic than church bells or bird song. Every mystery of art or faith he had ever desired the intimacy of was in that sound, and as he began to comprehend its rhythm and melody, he melted his own voice with it, and the quivering, piercing, exulting harmony made Dominic let loose for a while his anger. Ronnie, her weakness, caused Brian's face to shine like that of Moses at the sight of the Lord God and worked a magic on the two who chanted more enthralling than any wielded by a sorcerer's hand. And at last the spell reached such a height that it could not sustain itself, and was carried instead upon the higher music of waters. Within and without their music wound the voice of Lari, deepening the spell in prophetic speech, her upraised hand directing all eyes to the cataract of stars. Behold the steed of Kyalari! See how she rides upon it, subduing the heaven and the earth, Feel the hooves where they strike upon body and soul, splintering and remaking. Follow them. Race along their tracks to the waters. Let not your spirit be slow. Follow to the fountain. Plunge in and drown. Rise again with life everlasting as your steed. See where she rides and ride to overtake her. 
For there is no beauty, no purpose, no secret of joy, but in the waters of Kailare. And still the music of the fountain rose summitless, bearing the place of jubilation upon its crest. Rocked upon it, cradled in it, Brian slept, and then Nika slept, and Clement, Ronnie slept, and Mauger his swimming against the tide, Dominic slept too. Last of all, Laurie slept, but her eyes remained open to the anointing of starlight. At the hour the Tahitians called to Rapo, which is midnight, Lari woke. The waters had waned to their lesser peak of sublimity, and but for herself and Brian, who slumbered still, the place was unpeopled. All but one of the lights had burned and died. From this last she lit a torch of coconut leaves bound with bark, and with its aid, in the moons, commenced the ritual which the feast had caused her to delay from dusk. She walked first to the banyan, and found no blossoms nigh it that should not be near, though it seemed to her that its shade had so grown more oppressive that the moon's flame nor hers could penetrate that tyranny. She walked to the rocks of hearing, and she heard the drowsing breath of Brian and the ardent breath of Clement and Nika upon the lagoon's beach riding the song of waves, Nika whispering on the borrowed breath of breezes, Tane, Tane. She queried the rock's conduit of sound for other breath, but she was answered only with her own, and faintly beneath it a discord of bells. The scar upon her throat was beginning to pain her. She made her way to the rock-bound pool where she would bathe it to solace. She passed over the memorial of the others, for there was now no need to rekindle its lamp of sad reminiscence, for the others had returned. Chapter 10. The Pool in the Rain like mountain mists, like smoke of the underworld, steam rose and drifted from the bubbling pool where she bathed, its vapor veil turning luminous as the moon glow invested it. The image of her outspread fingers riding the surge of waters filled her with foreboding, though she did not know why. In thousands of years of descending the lichen-covered ledges that formed the pool's stairs, their stony surfaces shot through with quartz and chrysolite and worn smooth by the passage of bare feet, in the years of beholding the purple and rose, gold and scarlet of circia flowers, chalice vines, and tulip trees where they circled the water, dappled by the light of leaping torch and whirling star, in the multitudinous nights of hearing and gentle noises of animals snuffling and sighing as they dreamed, never before in all these had she seen her hands as marvels, clutching at the pool where it was kissed by the air, then resigning themselves to be drawn to an unknown deep. She did not fear the deep, but the anticipation of it was new to her, and therefore uncanny. Were they omens of cataclysm, these strange hands that straddled the foam, or of sweet change? Much had changed already for her, Lare, oracle of the goddess. The goddesses she remained, but no longer was she virgin in love. An oracle still, yet the nature of her understanding was altering. She perceived anew faces of Kyalari she had lost, faces mirrored by the others, the majesty of her was so much more than it had seemed for an immemorial time. The majesty of her and of him, for Kyalari had been known as a union of both before the long rain's sundering. The rock-bound pool where Lare bathed was uniformly round, but for a narrow cleft in its edge where a single body might secret itself in comforting confinement. Once, while hidden in that womb-like resting place, a thing had happened which pained her even yet when she permitted herself the memory pain that made itself most felt in the scar across her throat. Her pain was flaring. Lari swam to the cleft and let it embrace her, memory washing over her with the warmth and movement of the waters. It had been noon then and not dead of night, and Ronnie had been bathing in the pool also, though unaware of her. A sudden dimness had sullied the day, an occultation of sun by moon as she later knew, though at first she thought that the banyan had broken through its shadow bounds and in that dimness she had seen him standing on the pool's highest stair looking into the water, and as the sun had come into its own again he had begun to walk down. Each downward step was a harbinger of her disgrace, and he, Kayla, spying her where she hid, had delighted in the disgrace as contributing to his glory. From that delight had followed the trouble which had sealed the fountain and the other's fate. Now as she remembered that ancient eclipse and what had come after it, it seemed to her that the moon was snuffed out, as of old, she thought first of the banyan, then realized that the light had merely swathed itself in cloud. The rain comes, she thought. It follows soon. An arc of lightning electrified the night. And in that sudden flash, which was as quickly gone, at the head of the stair she saw him. As at his first coming to her, she thought she dreamed, but this time the illusion's strength was greater. 
He was dressed in native clothes such as the others had always worn, a girdle of tapa with its spreading tassels, the necklace of aromatic seeds. His skin was brown, his hair and eyes jet, and only his pigtail prevented the dream from being complete. But as the one for whom she had mistaken him had once looked to the pool, so now the second lightning, following the first thunder, showed him gazing instead toward the trees, at what or whom Lari could not see. The third lightning came, and he lifted his arm in gesture of command, a god summoning his believers to homage. Then as the moon was freed from cloud and the clouds let loose their burden of warm rain, he descended into the water, and as inevitably as thunder after lightning and the rain the clouds, Rani descended after him. He dressed as Caleb, but for the braid in his hair. She naked as long ago, but for the wreath of leaves upon her head. They came together, he without faltering, she shrinking back, but without power to forbear. Invisible and unheard through the barrier of their desire, Lari climbed from the pool, her scar burning with an agony as deep as that with which Scala's knife had branded her at its making. This thing she would have dreaded more than any other she had thought to dread, this same wave doubling back over her, had at least one new gift in it of the goddess's mercy. This time he did not see her, did not so acknowledge her as to take pleasure in her pain. For this at least she might be thankful, as her last hope to be loved as a woman is by nature loved by a man was laid to rest. And though she might know him again from the first moment knowing this, she would choose again to stand at the pool's brink, seeing what she saw, the warm rain running over her but not thawing her frost. How long she might have remained so, till dawn or till another thousand dawns were past, she could not have said, had not a hand of tenderness laid itself upon her arm, eyes of a blue approaching the deepness of her own looked where she looked with tears she could not shed and a voice of youth wise in its own way as her age whispered to her come away lari come away she came away but the image of her drowning hands she did not forget <laughs>